Welcome back to this workshop, um, to the afternoon of Planetary Sustainability 2021. Um, as we had, or I had some technical problems this morning, actually my internet went down, so I connected with my phone again, and I will want to give you uh, the short introductory remarks uh, for the workshop, what it's, what it's planetary, planetary sustainability is about. Um, I share my screen. So these days we go into space and it's space for zero as European Space Agency calls it because it's commercialized and we have a lot of uh, commercial interest in space and it's a cooperation of governments and space agencies and, and commercial entities to, uh, to advance space firing and satellite use. The space economy is already at 370 billion uh, last year, and it is, of course, growing. That's not a very big industry, but that's, uh, still it has some traction. There is, for instance, Blue Origin with the idea to grow into space. This 18-year-old Jeff Bezos told a newspaper he wanted to build space hotels, amusement parks, and colonies for two or three million people who would be in orbit. And there's still this idea that there are sorts of colonies around Earth in space, sort of big spaceships. Uh, he has his own space comp company and uh, aims at re re reusable launch vehicles, um, but the first mission still needs to be launched. More ahead is, of course, SpaceX with the idea, similar somehow, also to ground the space, but going multiplanetary. So the, Elon Musk is very much uh, busy with Mars, as we probably all know. Um, because he suggests that because of history, there will be some doomsday event. And the alternative for him is to become a space bearing civilization and a multiplanetary species. And Mars is just the next possible target for him. What other uh, planet you could think of in our solar, solar system? And there's a third big company, Virgin Galactic, which uh, wants to develop space tourism. And you could, of course, all criticize all these approaches, but they also have some positive impact. At least space tourism has a positive side as well, because uh, because of space, we know that we live on a blue marble, a uh, space, um, a unique place in space, which is not available everywhere. Um, we have to take care of this home. And actually, the pre preciousness of our planet was uh, underlined by our space firing. Then we have all the satellites orbiting Earth, uh, enabling our civilization as it is today. We, we couldn't do much about, uh, without them in our civilizatory um, endeavors these days. Then there are plans, there were early plans to go to the moon again, with a moon village which developed into the lunar gateway idea that there's sorts of an international space station around the moon. Um, and then there are place, uh, space mining plans, which started with asteroid mining ideas, but which are now more focused on water mining on the moon um, for a start. And all these developments show us that it's, we are going into space these days. But there are, of course, also problems, as we already heard now on this day, the big problem of space debris. How, we can, how can we go into space in a sustainable manner? So what is the future of space tourism? Because if you start a little, it's not a problem. The first satellite wasn't a problem. But if you have lots of tourists in one day, then you can have a problem with it. How to address space debris? We discussed this. When we harvest resources in space, space is an international domain. Um, what about the sharing of these benefits? Because it's our common heritage out there. And can space mining be sustainable, actually? Um, that would be a question of its own, because, well, asteroids don't regrow. What is planetary sustainability about? Um, sustainable development is a development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So it's a long-term point of view, what, what the idea of sustainability is about. And uh, 
essential for it is first of all that cooperation and peace are kept on the planet because else we will perish as this picture drastically illustrates but there can be other events which and there musk is right could happen and so if we want to really really have a really sustainable future in the long run we need to take care um, about our uh, extension and our future also in, into space. Without the expansion of our instruments and people into space, humanity could conceivably perish. So this leads to the following idea. Later generations should be able to meet their own needs without perishing due to events in our solar system. This is my adaption of the idea of sustainability. And um, so uh, this leads to several principles. We need to keep up all dimensions of sustainability to be able to um, to live long enough on this planet, which is very precious. But we also need a technological imperative because we can't stay here forever. There will be some event which will limit our lifetime here. And of course, it's also not endless because of the sun as a second generation star. It is growing very slowly, but it is growing. And um, yeah, we will have a limited time here. So we need to take care of planetary protection and defense. So the protection is against contamination. If we go onto into space, we don't know if there might be microbes somewhere or viruses. And I don't need to underline these days what the danger of this is. And defense, so we need to um, think about if there would be asteroids on the wrong track, how to uh, deflect them early enough so they don't hit Earth. So we can do something in our own, on our own, and um, uh, act uh, with the situations. We are responsible for our future on this planet. That's the imperative of responsibility. An idea of Hans Jonas, who expressed it with the words, act so that the effects of your action are compatible with the permanence of genuine human life. This, this for me, it was expressed quite early in the 70s, I think, uh, under, it's like the idea of sustainability in ethical words. But this includes for me, and this is a bit different from Jonas, that we need to look into space as well in the long run. So we have the sustainable development goals, which uh, cover almost every aspect of, of life on this planet, which is important. And we have life on land, 15, life below water, 14, and climate action, 13. But we miss one dimension. That's the only thing missing. We are missing our space environment, I would say. And that, that I, I think we need to integrate this discussion. This is what this workshop aims at, to have the space discussion on the one hand connected to the planetary discussion. And um, not, not to have like a sci-fi club on the one hand and then the sustainability club on the other hand, but to integrate it. And we know because of space debris, how urgent that is already. So this is the basic idea. Act so that the effects of your action are compatible with the permanence of genuine human life, because it's worth it. Um, this is how you can contact me. And um, in the, the other part of this introductory talk by Andre, you already saw this morning. And uh, Shan is also with us, and she also already presented. And uh, I think... Uh, this was my part. <laughs> I was in, would have been in time if I would have been there this morning. Thank you for listening. I don't know if, um, I mean, if everyone uh, realized that we started early, but if there is anybody who has a question now, I, I'm welcome to answer it. You're very quiet, quiet uh, Sean. You, I hear you very, ah, right. <laughs> it works now. <laughs> yes, uh, we have a question. Um, how, this, this is a fantastic idea that you have pushing forward the idea of um, SDG 18 for space sustainability. Um, I was wondering uh, how long have you been um, pushing this idea for and what has been the major challenges along the way as you promote um, this SDG idea? 
Well, actually, I, um, well, I had the idea in the beginning of 2018 and wrote about it in a blog, but it's just when the sustainable development goals have been still quite young and uh, started to being implemented and uh, considered and discussed. Um, but the, I'm not the only one who pushes this idea, and that's very good, I think, so we, we can join uh, causes. There, is, there, was, there was a delegate of the National Space Agency who suggested um, a space economy goal, which I think is a bit too limited because I think the problem is not the economy, but uh, the environment which is limited. And um, then also there's the Space for All initiative uh, from, uh, uh, from a group of students. And uh, this is also very, quite prominent now. And so we, I think we can join courses there and try to, I think it's important for the next iteration or whatever comes after the SDGs in 2030 to have space on the agenda. And we already heard that it's almost too late, maybe not too late, we discussed this, but maybe it's, it's high time to integrate space into our, because it's into our discussion, because it's interconnected. There's the satellites and the civilization on earth, this is not two different worlds. It's not like there's a sci-fi community and then there's a planet or the globe. But it's um, it's connected, yeah. Thank you. Um, we have another question um, from the floor. Um, so, what about the relationship between individual human beings and humanity? Well, that's a very tricky one because um, I think it's important for, but it's, it's also part of a, dis a plan global discussion, so to say, which um, well, where you think if it's more the humanity as a whole, which is important or the individual. I think I sh we shouldn't separate this too much. For me, um, we need maybe to think a bit more communal in the West, um, to think about the um, uh, communal challenges and tasks we have on this planet. Um, but of, so individual freedom has an end there where we are all affected, yeah? And where we need to, to think globally. Um, well, and, um, but I, of course, still part of this tradition and I think uh, the, the, the dignity of the individual is very important and should only, should be uh, considered always and every time, but maybe we need the individuals to be convinced um, to act globally. Thank you. Um, we probably have a question along the similar line. Um, would you like me to go ahead and... and... Yeah, we can have one more question and then uh, it's yeah. Gaetan's... Um... All right. So um, planetary sometimes refers to our Earth, sometimes to other planets and worlds as well. Is that right? Yeah, actually, <laughs> the term is a bit uh, ambiguous. Um, I started with sort of an interplanetary approach because I first were, worked in the field of astrobiology, so looking for exoplanets with other life and um, um, what would my idea was what is if there's life out there that would of course pose a lot of new questions but then I realized that already on our planet here the earth we have we already have a lot of challenges with space debris and um, um, space mining evolving and um, so there's so, so enough to discuss and address uh, right now so, but ideally it should be an integrated discussion and um, I just want to bridge, as I said, um, the, the far reaching sci-fi thought and the uh, pressing reality we have regarding space debris and uh, planetary concerns, of course, as well. Uh, so for instance, an, uh, an idea I recently had was, as I mentioned in one comment, that maybe the planetary boundaries need to include some orbital boundaries, which, uh, um, so the concept of boundaries needs to be uh, extended to our space environment. I actually thought the idea of orbital boundary was really interesting and refreshing. So yeah, Thank you. that's a good one. <laughs> so I think we are um, on time to move on to the next um, session, challenges and opportunities one. So I guess, um, may I, uh, 
pass the floor back to you, Andreas, as the main moderator, and I will be co-moderating with the questions from the floor. Thank you, Sean. Um, yeah, so we welcome now Dr. Gaetan Petit. He's a co-founder of Space for Impact, uh, whose platform we are just using, an initiative that aims at fostering the economic growth of space activities in line with the UN SDGs for a sustainable future. Gaetan worked as a technology transfer officer at the Swiss Space Center and as a scientist at the European Space Agency's Advanced Concepts Team. Gaetan holds an engineering degree from EPFL Lausanne and a PhD in neuroscience from ETH Zurich. Gaetan, there you are and the floor Hi. is yours. <laughs> thanks Andreas, thanks for the introduction and thanks for this uh, wonderful event. We had great discussion this morning with uh, the participants and the, and the speakers you brought on stage and I'm looking forward to the discussion this afternoon as well. Um, I've prepared a few slides and uh, I will just uh, try to share my screen. Uh, let me know if you see my full screen there. Um, just a second. So I hope everything is you good see, like that. Nice, yeah, it's nice. All right. So as Andreas uh, just introduced, uh, our project Space for Impact, you probably saw the logo also on the platform where you follow the event today. Uh, we're really happy of this collaboration with uh, Andreas and the topic of address today, since it's very aligned to what we believe in. And um, as, as stated on the slide at Space for Impact, we believe that space can do more for Earth. Um, so the platform, uh, event platform that you uh, experiencing or like where, where you're following the event today is one thing, but basically what we try to do with Space for Impact is a, a little bit different. What we try to do is reach, bring space technologies to non-space actors. So we play as a tech translator. We try to explain to people that don't have any experience in space technologies what space technology can do for them. And our uh, target group is more industries that could benefit from uh, space innovation and space technologies or downstream applications, how we call it. Um, and um, and we how we do that basically we work with space startups so the new space startups and we try to bring them new customers for their products uh, so their innovation can have a, a more powerful impact on Earth. Next slide is just a small map of a few startups that you can find on the on the platform. I will just uh, show you the platform a bit uh, later, but uh, don't accept the event uh, module, but you can open it in a new tab uh, on the Space for Impact platform and basically explore uh, the different startups that we have on the on the platform. Um, as you can see, there is many different logos coming from uh, more than 28 countries around the globe. So we're a Swiss-based uh, initiative, but we operation uh, we have operation all around uh, the globe. We also tackle a lot of different uh, technologies, uh, downstream technologies, but not only. Um, what is important for us is that all the startups have a clear impact on Earth. Uh, is that their technology or their product has an impact, and that's really what is core for us. And that's also what we will find on the on the platform when exploring their products. So this is how the, the platform looks like. Um, basically, you experience the, the, the event model uh, on, on the upper left uh, side, but you can also go to the marketplace and see the products of the different startups. Uh, you can uh, now uh, filter them by industry. So depending which uh, industry you come from, if it's outside of the space field, you can uh, basically explore what space technology can do for you. Uh, you can go directly also on the, on the profiles of the startups or talk to different members. Also in the event uh, module, you can talk to any of the participants attending the event today. And you can also schedule uh, networking one-to-one uh, -one meetings uh, in, the, in the evening. So I think from... Uh, uh, five to six after the event, there will be another opportunity to meet with other participants. And you can just go into the networking tab and schedule yourself a meeting. But what you don't see on the platform because it's not live, and that's basically what we are selling to non-space uh, companies is uh, the opportunity to do an open innovation challenge with us and with space startups. And basically what we do is that we talk to industries that have nothing to do with space, try to understand what are the technology uh, roadmap or innovation or needs, and we try to bring them space solutions for their needs. 
And uh, to do that, uh, we have a very simple pipeline. Uh, basically, we organize, we try to define the challenge with our, the potential uh, corporates or uh, the potential customers. And uh, basically, after that, we run a startup competition where we try to bring the more sensible uh, startups uh, that could answer the need of the companies. And what is important for us is that we can run this and try to bring uh, solutions from all around the globe uh, using space technologies for positive impact. But what is very important for us is that we also follow these projects on the long run. So our goal after the competition is really to implement the projects and help the startups build a pilot project with a potential new customer and really try to help them um, tailor the, the product to the needs of the non-space industry. As said, we're based in Switzerland and we are a spin-off from uh, existing initiatives in Switzerland. Uh, but we operation, our operations are uh, broader than just Switzerland in Europe first, but also uh, worldwide. Um, and um, basically, uh, we come uh, after uh, space innovation. If you're from Switzerland, you probably heard of the Swiss Space Center, which is called now Space Innovation, which helps academia and uh, the space industry in Switzerland to innovate and to be at the top of, uh, of uh, the, the technology uh, roadmap of, of uh, the European Space Agency as well. And we come also after the uh, European Space Agency Business Incubator, which is one of our close partner, who helps uh, spin-offs from uh, academia uh, to uh, be created and help them with a bit of uh, seed funding to really uh, create their company and their product. But usually these products are tailor-made for space uh, customers and nobody really helps them to tackle non-space industry and customers. And that's really where we want to act with Space for Impact is to bring this technology, this space technology back to earth. Uh, that's why you see a small uh, blue planet uh, here uh, where we act and we try to basically transfer this technology to new applications. So our value at uh, Space for Impact, as I said before, we have an uh, international focus um, and we are a social enterprise, meaning that we don't try to uh, do a profit uh, for ourselves. We try to help the new space ecosystem and uh, basically we try to reinject these uh, revenues into sensible uh, topics and sensible projects. And our long-term goal is to basically assess the impact of space technologies on Earth, a bit like the SSR that Nikolai presented this morning. So we want to have also a label assessing the impact of space technologies in non-space industries. So that's our long-term view. Andreas asked me to uh, give a small uh, overview of a few concrete examples of what space technologies can do uh, for our planet. Uh, the best way to get uh, this overview is to go on our platform and go directly on the profiles of the companies or the new space startups and see what they have to offer and what do they do. Um, but here I have just a few slides about a few examples. Uh, also happy to take questions in the chat uh, for uh, later. I think we will have a bit of time afterward. So one example, uh, this is uh, the, the picture on the right is, uh, is a, from a, a company called Exolabs. There is another Swiss company called Wigo also, which is doing a similar product. Basically what they do is that they monitor uh, snow uh, in our Swiss mountains in real time. And what they want to do with this is to try to predict how much water will be in the high altitude lakes. This uh, for uh, better monitoring the, the dams and the electricity productions and the hydropower production from these uh, high altitude dams, which is one of the main source of energy in Switzerland. And basically by using earth observation images, it's, um, uh, we can basically uh, uh, predict the, the amount of uh, energy that we can produce from, from there. So this is a very concrete uh, commercial applications of earth observation uh, images. Um, but there is other applications that you might know, uh, like monitoring uh, climate change, of course, um, and uh, uh, moni uh, monitoring or managing or mitigating uh, natural disasters as well uh, using remote sensing and earth observation. This is another uh, startup also in ecosystem that you can find on the platform, Astrocast. Uh, there is also Kinase that has a similar, a similar uh, product. Um, basically, they want to launch a constellation of CubeSats or small satellites with, a, uh, with an instrument that will enable uh, IoT, meaning that basically they will be able to monitor or to record small data packages anywhere around the globe at any time. Uh, so any uh, sensor or small hardware that has no coverage on ground uh, would basically be able to communicate with this constellation. 
And this is very powerful because you could, uh, uh, I mean, there is many applications. Uh, one, one that we can think of is basically the, moni the, the monitoring of uh, vaccines, for example. When you have to ship vaccines from one side of the globe to another, you need to monitor, uh, for example, for the Pfizer uh, vaccines from, for, for Corona, you have uh, for COVID, you have to uh, monitor that they stay at the right temperature. And you might not have any cellular co coverage all, the, all over the, the trip. And with a small chip, you could basically monitor this in real time all over the globe without interference or interruption. So this is just one uh, application, but there is many more. Uh, in remote areas, there is some infrastructures that we need to uh, monitor, and this is the way to go. Another application and hot topic is smart cities. Um, and I will talk a bit later also about uh, monitoring green spaces. Uh, so this is using uh, of observation data to monitor uh, green spaces. There is a few startups in our ecosystem do, selling uh, uh, products or services in this field. There is also uh, beside, beside of observation, you can use the GNSS so global navigation systems uh, or GPS data or Galileo data to also track movements in cities and urban in, and in urban areas. Uh, and the combination of Earth observation and GNSS data is very powerful uh, for better understanding our cities and understanding how our cities are growing. So many applications in this field as well. But one of the most promising uh, or the most important one is basically the use of uh, Earth observation or meteo data for smart agriculture uh, or smart precision farming, basically by uh, monitoring uh, soils quality or water amount or meteo data, you can be better predict uh, or better help the farmers to use the right crops or monitoring how the crops grow uh, to better uh, improve their uh, yields. Um, and you can also basically give them better data on how to use fertilizers and when to use fertilizers. So this is a big uh, um, commercial applications and a big field uh, and the full value chain of food industry or food safety will benefit from uh, space technologies in this example. I don't know if Emmanuel already joined us into the, the panel, but she, she will speak a bit later. And together with a few um, our, of our partners, we're putting together an online lecture um, at EPFL. So it will be online uh, this summer or at the end of the summer uh, and accessible to everybody for free. Uh, the goal here is really to educate people about what space technology can do outside of the space field. So how can you use space technologies and space services um, in your industry if you have no experience in the field. And every week we want to tackle another industry vertical and try really to explain what this technology can do. Um, so examples like in the energy uh, uh, vertical, what how, how to use space technology and space remote sensing or monitoring. In the forestry uh, business, uh, in finance, uh, in insurances, but also reinsurances and the management of disaster and many more. Um, so yeah, stay tuned and uh, we will be happy to share this with you. We think that has a uh, huge potential to really educate people about business opportunities in non-space industries and also help young entrepreneurs to create sensitive missions and sensitive space uh, startups. The last slide uh, I wanted to show you is a small project that we will run in June. So the European Commission is launching a new hackathon program. It used to be called Copernicus. Now it is called Cassini. Um, Switzerland is, became eligible since it's not only about Copernicus data, so Earth observation, it's also about GNSS data. So the Galileo uh, program is also part of these hackathons. And basically for the first time, we will host one local hackathon in, uh, in Switzerland on these topics. And uh, around the table, we have all our partners, close partners from Switzerland, the one working on Earth observation with the University of Geneva, Swiss Data Cube, but also University of Zurich. I see Oliver Ulrich is gonna be talking a bit later. Uh, so we have um, try, we try to bring everybody around uh, the table to really push this and raise awareness about the applications of space technologies. The topic this year is green uh, digitalization of, uh, sorry, digitalization of green spaces. Uh, for this, we will uh, give to the participant uh, Earth observation data from Sentinel-1, 2, and 5P, so pollution data as well. Um, and uh, some um, local uh, uh, data sets about transport, for example, and other things like that. It's very important also that they use uh, navigation uh, data about tracking uh, movements and people. 
And uh, yeah, we're looking forward to this competition. Our partners also gave some uh, prizes for helping uh, young uh, professionals to create startups after after this. So uh, yeah, if you feel like it, join join this event in June, and we'll be happy to help you go further using uh, space technologies and space data for for good. And with this, uh, we'll stop sharing my screen, and uh, we'll be taking questions if there is any. Thank you so much, Gaetan. Um, yeah, so we now know where we are situated with this workshop and uh, we much enjoy your professional support and approach um, and your flexibility in uh, in adding such an event, sort of event into your schedule. So, um, and, um, yeah, is there, um, are there questions from the audience to um, Gaetan and Space for Impact? Sean, do we have questions? Um, well, I do have a question for Gaitan. Um, I thought this was uh, really interesting. Um, and um, remember, you uh, uh, no, it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I am. I am sorry. I am. Yes, and um, thank you for the very nice and interesting presentation, Gaitan. Um, um, as far as we understand is that um, Earth observation brings a lot of opportunities, but one of the major challenges of deploying Earth observation um, is through or, or translating the raw data of this Earth observation into application services. So I was wondering um, in your initiatives, um, um, have you come across any uh, uh, resistance from rather um, incumbent actors who are more favoring conventional in situ inspections or, or, or ground based in inspection because this might come into um, 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 contradiction with satellite imagery, imagery data. So I would say we talk to different industry vertical. One is insurances. Uh, reinsurances is a bit different. You have companies like 33 and uh, Minicree, which are using Earth observation data in-house already, but a lot of them don't. Uh, and insurance company are far from using Earth observation data in their daily uh, uh, life. And they have their own data sets. Uh, sometimes they, they use Meteo data, but, uh, but they far from, from integrating that into, into their products, and into their uh, analytics. Uh, there is a huge work to do there and to really bring um, uh, earth observation uh, services or products uh, uh, to this industry. There is many startups that are trying to do that, uh, which are selling custom-made uh, products uh, to potential customers. Uh, you have another approach, uh, a Swiss company called Pictera, which is um, putting together a, a, a SaaS platform where you could upload your own images and, and try to detect your own uh, features in there. So this is a bit different approach where they try to uh, raise awareness about the fact that everybody can basically access this observation data and uh, extract information from it. Uh, this is a very interesting approach, um, uh, but it will also take time before a lot of people can actually use it uh, in a more uh, corporate uh, life. We are trying to do something a bit different uh, with uh, space innovation as well. And uh, the, the ETH AI Center, we try to bring together um, a, a new platform where uh, people could uh, basically access uh, Earth observation images without having any knowledge about this. So really like a Google search engine for this type of uh, information. This will uh, come up uh, or only in six months and uh, happy to present that at the next talk. Maybe I have one, one more, maybe more technical, I don't know, or content question. Um, you showed very nicely how the different um, initiatives of your platform that are um, for, to be found on your platform relate to the SDGs. This reminded me a bit of the Space for SDGs program of UNOSA. Is it possible if you like look for a certain SDG to filter the companies on your platform for this already? It is in the back of the platform, but not live yet. It should be live by the end of the month. That's what uh, I've been told. But uh, yes, indeed, that's that's exactly how we select the startups as well. We ask them to prove that they have a link to at least one SDGs. Most of them can make the link to many more. And we have that, like we can filter the companies uh, per industry or per application or per space technology, we will also be able to filter them per impact uh, or type of impact. 
okay. but this is just the beginning of the journey. As I said, our goal is really to make an impact label out of space, I mean, to explain how space technologies can help. And this is uh, a much bigger project, a bit like what uh, the WEF uh, is doing for uh, space sustainability. We want to do it for back to earth applications as well. Okay, great. Um, yeah, are there further questions from the speakers or the audience? Um, there is another question. Um, I, I was wondering from your um, initiatives and impacts, um, what about the um, um, responses from developing country context? Uh, so do they, because of their, um, probably they lack certain capabilities in, um, in, in situ or, or, or ground-based inspections. Um, so these earth observations sort of serve as an op window of opportunity for developing countries to actually skip very old ways of building infrastructures and leap forward to, but I'm sure they also face some challenges. Uh, do you have any insights on that to share with us? Thank you for this question. I think I think you're totally right. Uh, using uh, uh, downstream uh, uh, applications or data, uh, uh, space data is a great opportunity for countries or region in the world where there is no local ground segment infrastructure, uh, because the coverage is global of uh, space data is uh, of course uh, uh, covering the world uh, globally and evenly, um, and uh, and uh, of course uh, there is still a long way uh, between getting access to data and analyzing the data and extracting information from this data but we've met uh, some very interesting uh, projects and uh, and teams and startups also in uh, uh, space uh, raising nations uh, totally capable and that will basically bridge uh, this uh, lack of information for other uh, uh, nations as well so uh, i think it's really promising of course uh, we need to help them as we can with uh, any type of funding or knowledge or transfer of knowledge uh, between uh, the the, the between different actors, so their uh, SDG 17 and partnership is quite important. And uh, I think everybody here in this panel uh, also uh, can help with that uh, to share knowledge and really bring everybody up to uh, speed. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, um, don't know, are there more questions uh, in the, in the, not at the moment. Not at the moment. Okay, so maybe just a, a reminder that you can use after the event. Uh, I want to start with the next talk just in time because maybe people join later just for the talk and they else miss something. Um, after the event at five, you can still sign up for one-to-one um, -one meetings with other participants and also speakers who are registered on the platform. So um, for the, maybe Gaetan, if you can, it, we have, as I said, we have um, five minutes or seven minutes left. Can you um, give a walkthrough uh, how to do this very shortly? If sure. people want to. Would be my pleasure. So I'm going to share my screen again. And this time you're going to be on the platform itself. So it's going to be a bit weird because you're going to see the live YouTube uh, that we are recording at the same time. Um, so do you guys see my computer again and the live stream? I post the video on you, Andreas, so you see, should see yourself. I see a smile, so that means that yes, you see yourself in there. Um, and basically, um, if you go, so basically, so this is the live platform where you can basically follow the, all the talks. You can also go on participants and, and message any of the participants. Um, if the participants are not connected to the platform, they will receive an email telling them that you try to reach to them and they can answer back. But what we put together is, so there was a networking event during lunchtime, but we run out a bit of time, uh, but there is a second networking event in the afternoon. So from five to six, and basically you can open the uh, platform here, uh, open the session and select any of the speakers that you want to meet and select the time slot you want to meet them and send a request. The other participant will receive an email if not connected, sending saying that you want to, uh, to request a one-to-one -one meeting with them. And uh, when the time comes, you will just get into the same session here, click on the video, it's gonna be another, it's not, it's not gonna be on YouTube or on Zoom, it's gonna be on Jitsi, another small platform. Um, and uh, you will have the chance to talk for 15 minutes to any of the participants. 
So I hope you uh, enjoyed the event so far and that uh, the platform helps you to make good connections and uh, build uh, partnerships and uh, collaborations on the long run. Yeah, and if there are any technical issues, I think there's a, to the bottom left, there's a support button and um, also there is, you can send an email to info at space for impact, space for impact with a four uh, org, I guess, right? Indeed. So our partners at InnoLoft who, who are providing the, the platform for us uh, would be happy to uh, answer your questions through the support button. Uh, we can also thank them for providing such a tool and for more general questions or any technical questions, you can also email us at info at space for impact, uh, dot org. Uh, you should have received that in your email from Andreas yesterday. So happy to help you out if any uh, technical issues emerge. Okay. So as I, as I said, I want to start the next session on time. So uh, we have now four minutes break um, because it's, it's, I think it's a, a, a pity if people um, miss the next talk and uh, see you in four minutes. So there we are again. Um, Dovidi, you're here, wonderful, wonderful. Um, I start with presenting you, so you have the full half an hour discussion and presentation time. Um, Dovile Matu Leviciute, did I say it right? <laughs> I hope. <Perfect. laughs> Thank you. Holds the position of policy officer responsible for legal affairs at the Luxembourg Space Agency. At the Space Agency, her fields of expertise are international affairs and relations as well as legal and regulatory issues. Mrs. Matule Vitute is a delegate of Luxembourg to the International Relations Committee of ESA, the United Nations Corporate Scientific and Technical Subcommittee, and Legal Subcommittee. Before joining the Ministry of the Economy and the Luxembourg Space Agency in 2016, she worked at a private space company where she was managing legal and contractual matters. She gained her first experience in various fields such as business law, markets regulation, and competition law intellectual property law, property law, international public law, and European Union law at multiple international recognized law firms based in Vilnius, Berlin, Berlin, Paris, and Brussels. Brussels. Yeah. So I hand over to you, and I'm very much looking forward to your talk on space resources and innovation. Thank you, Andreas, for this wonderful introduction. Mm, I tried to share some slides. Can you see them? Oh, sorry. Somehow I do. Yeah, it's great. It's no, it's the first one. <laughs> Very good. I was on the last one. So today I will speak about space resources and innovation, specifically about the Space Resources Dotelu initiative, which Luxembourg launched in 2016, and European Space Resources Innovation Center, which we created last year. So I will start from um, a little bit more of a general background. So we know that there are huge benefits and opportunities uh, which, will enable, um, which will be enabled by space resources utilization. Um, space resources are available and valuable and they will create the future space economy. Um, at the same time, uh, space resources will enable deeper space exploration, human expansion, and the technology which is used for space resources activities has near term and commercial value. So space resources utilization value chains uh, vary in terms of applications, types of resources and mission profiles. So from the application perspective, uh, space resources could be used for life support to astronauts um, as a propellant for launch vehicles and other space vehicles. Um, it will also be used for construction, uh, including radiation shielding of in situ infrastructures um, manufacturing of equipment in space, um, as well as earth-based use of platinum group metals. Of course, this, the last one, will be in a, in a long term. The resources which we can find in space is water, abundant on uh, Moon and Mars, uh, hydrogen, oxygen, nit nitrogen, carbon, uh, methane, uh, uh, metals, different metals, regolith, uh, and of course, platinum group metals. And mission profiles, they vary from Earth's orbits, uh, going to the moon and its orbits, and uh, then from moon to the Mars, and of course, in the long-term near Earth's asteroids. 
and the space resources utilization value chain include prospection, establishment of different infrastructures in space, mining, transportation, refinement, manufacturing, and supply. Space uh, resources utilization benefits are recognized by space agencies and integrated in their future plans for lunar development. So uh, ISEC-G, um, International Space Exploration Coordination Group, um, published a global exploration roadmap, which also includes a mission scenario for 2040, uh, 2024 to 2030. Uh, and the objective of global exploration roadmap is to demonstrate in-situ resource production and utilization capability uh, sufficient for crew transportation between lunar surface and gateway, as well as uh, lunar surface utilization needs. And the rationale behind is to expedite uh, sustainability for future human moon and Mars exploration and to identify future commercial markets on lunar surface. So ISEC-G is composed of 23 space agencies and the global exploration roadmap presents a shared international vision for human and robotic space exploration and is based on the coordinated programs initiatives and goals on the ISEC, of the ISEG agencies this coordinated vision from the ISEG agencies around the world recognizes that the difficult and long-term challenges of space flight are best achieved through uh, cooperative ventures. Um, so institute resources utilization contributes to the following three main goals of the global exploration roadmap, which are to expand the human pre presence into the solar system. The second is to stimulate economic prosperity and foster international cooperation. Um, in 2018, uh, our space agency together with European Space Agency carried out study on the future space resources utilization value chain. The study was led by PwC and we developed an exploration roadmaps for, for ourselves. So in the addition to the cost savings exercise, we did an analysis to derive an overall timeline as well as related opportunities and risks. An overall timeline was derived for uh, the three main locations. Uh, moon, asteroids, and Mars, uh, and for the three main type, type of resources. So water, regolith, and metals. Uh, a key aspect from the discussions with share stakeholders is that the Moon and Mars would be higher priorities for space resources utilization than the common idea of asteroids due to their accessibility in terms of mission profile and the ability to perform uh, in situ prospection prior to act actual exploitation missions. And as well, uh, those missions um, are better in terms of uh, total amount of resources available and the level of demand at these locations. Uh, the, results of our, the result of our study is that space resources utilization would make exploration uh, missions feasible budget-wise in the medium term and is highly strategic for long-term space exploration vision and would improve the autonomy of manned missions, uh, greatly increasing mission safety. Watcher would be the first target for its abundance on the Moon and Mars and its criticality in space applications, for example, as a propellant. The scientific missions led by space agencies would probably be the first clients, the first customers of the private industry, and earth mining industry should be also involved in this uh, for their expertise and practical understanding of extracting and processing techniques. In terms of risk, uh, challenge is refining the geological knowledge. It still remains a strong barrier. And there is also a strong skepticism on the realistic uh, aspects of bringing back uh, platinum group metals, which we see more as a very long-term goal. Um, the important, uh, importance of uh, in, in situ resources utilization has been also recognized by many countries, so particular in the US. So in the security, uh, in the US R&D budget priorities for 2021, so next to American security leadership in industries of the future, they also recognized uh, American space exploration and, uh, and commercialization. And one year ago in April, 2020, there was also an executive order on encouraging international support for the recovery and use of space resources. Uh, in Europe, European Space Agency developed and published in May 20, 2020 
2019 uh, ESA Space Resources Strategy, um, tackling the challenge of sustained and sustainable human presence in space with a vision uh, to establish human presence at the moon uh, by 2040. The objectives of European Space Agency space resources strategy focusing on the moon mainly for the period 2020-2030 are to confirm that the space resources can enable sustainable uh, space exploration and which resources of, are of a primary interest for this purpose. Uh, to, it, it, the second objectives of the strategy is also to identify and create new scientific and economic opportunities for European industry and academia. Uh, it also seeks to create benefits in the areas of technology and processes innovation for sustainability in space and on Earth. Um, so European Space Agency also aims at engaging new industrial actors in the space endeavor um, and establishing ESA's role as part of a broader community of international public and private actors um, to create a new international and commercial partnerships. Um, from our perspective, um, we know that there are several key challenges. Uh, so uh, capabilities necessary to prospect and utilize space resources um, still must be developed, tested and matured. Regulatory framework still has to be clarified and for some issues still created uh, in order to protect entrepreneur, assure investors and ensure responsible activities in space. Um, these activities will require substantial investments and, and for this purpose, different tools and instruments must be also uh, created in order to enable private firms to develop and deploy their space uh, critical systems. From business perspective, um, the business model shall be identified also with a near term potential um, in order to ensure the incremental growth um, as the market today is still nascent. So in 2016, with this, uh, in order to tackle these challenges, um, Luxembourg launched its space resources.lu initiative. Um, according to our mission statement, Luxembourg aims to contribute to the peaceful exploration and sustainable utilization of space resources for the benefit of humankind. Um, space resources uh, was um, a, a, a so when we launched the initiative, we also designed a specific strategy with five strategic pillars, uh, tackling all these important challenges. So we also first we started from ensuring national political support and promoting international cooperation. We signed different agreements with um, a number of countries. We also started building clear legal framework first of all at the uh, national level and also engaging internationally because there are also all list of questions. Uh, which shall be discussed and addressed uh, with other countries. Uh, we promote long-term public support and workforce engagement by education and R&D. Um, regarding innovation, we provide dedicated support for industrial R&D activities. And, and at the same time, in parallel, we also develop long-term funding instruments. Um, so Luxembourg, uh, as one of the first movers, is now recognized also as one of the worldwide leaders in this, in this domain. Uh, global awareness has rapid, rapidly increased and Luxembourg has stepped up its international engagements. So we also signed, for example, a cooperation agreement with Euro um, European Investment Bank, um, with European Space Agency, bilateral agreements, and also agreements with some space agencies like NASA, DLR, NES. Um, we contribute contributed to rapid progress on further clarifying the legal regulatory framework. Um, last year, for example, we signed uh, Na, um, Artemis Accords with NASA, uh, address, uh, addressing cooperation and operations on the moon. Um, so talking about the innovation, um, the latest major step was the creation of the European Space Resources Innovation Center. Um, so ESRIC aims to become the internationally recognized center of expertise for scientific, technical, business and economic aspects related to the use of space resources for human and robotic exploration, as well as for a future in space economy. Uh, so the creation of ESRIC follows the memorandum of cooperation that we signed with ESA 
2019. So formally, the uh, ESRIC was established in August 2020 by the LSA and Luxembourg Institute of Science and Technology um, as the National Innovation Center in the field of space resources. And last year in November, the uh, European Space Agency became uh, a strategic partner of ESRIC. And currently, ESRIC is hosted by Luxembourg Institute of Science and Technology. ESRIC will develop activities in four main domains in close cooperation with public and private partners. So in the research pillar, um, it's recognized that research is at the heart of ESRIC's mission to build a future in space economy. And ESRIC will establish world-class labs and testing facilities to undertake ground-based energy along the space resources value chain. At the same time, uh, under business pillar, ESRIC will support commercial initiatives from established players and startups, um, enable technology transfer between space and non-space industries, and encourage public-private partnerships uh, and new initiatives. We also have uh, two pillars on the knowledge and community management. So ESRIC will provide a source um, of up-to-date information on development related to space resources utilization, and it will help uh, to connect the space resources community by creating an open collaborative environment to encourage that dialogue and exchange of ideas. So this year, uh, just in November, uh, so in April um, last week, we organized Space Resources Week, which was organized together um, by ESRIC, uh, Luxembourg Space Agency and European Space Agency. And the um, event covered topics um, on, on legal, scientific, technical, and business matters. Um, and we had a specific focus on cooperation with non-space industry. So we had like more than 120 speakers and more than 1,000 uh, participants. And um, so at the same time, um, it's not only uh, the, the ESRIC, but also we have other uh, research institutions which are um, involved in the um, in, in situ resources utilization. So University of Luxembourg developed uh, quite many activities uh, for national as well. And in 2019, we launched an interdisciplinary space master, um, which includes modules on space resources exploration and utilization. So that's it from my side. I hand back to Andreas. Thank you so much, Davile. Um, yeah, so we have a, a explorative overview of uh, your activity there. May, may, may I start with the first question? Um, <laughs> this is uh, because that's how I um, well found your or found found my interest in your project. It's the very early formulation which you showed on one slide again: the sustainable use of space resources. How do you understand sustainable there? Right, utilization of space resources. Okay. Um, sustainable utilization, you know, we do not have an intention to have uh, activities which, first of all, are against international law, international space treaties. So for us, it's very important that those activities, they are authorized, supervised, and we actually know what is happening in space. At the same time, and you know, from different activities which we have in Luxembourg, it's also very important that we think about some kind of benefit sharing. And this is probably where we could think about an ethical consideration as well, um, that you know, space should be explored for the benefit of, of everyone, for, for the benefit of all countries and humankind. And you know, the question would be you know, how we could also share those benefits, what benefits and how. So sustainability, you know, we could also think about uh, contribution to, to, to the science, uh, technology, applications, um, also, how we develop our international cooperation in order to avoid any kind of conflicts, and also you know what would be the basic rules when we are there, we have to all respect. Thank you. Um, now that's very interesting. Um, you, you, you mentioned you joined the Artemis Accords. Um, now you are the legal mm -hmm. officer, so I may ask you this question, maybe, although it's a tricky one. <laughs> Ever thought about the Moon Agreement? If, if we haven't thought about Moon Agreement? If you thought about joining it, or what oh. are your thoughts on that? <laughs> <laughs> I know you ask a very controversial question. So we plan to join. Uh, 
so now we just recently we ratified a convention of registration uh, of space objects and we also plan to ratify the rescue agreement however we do not have plans to ratify moon agreement for a moment okay. but if you if you if you looked at the signatories of the artemis accords there was also australia uh, which signed artemis accords um and you know, they found that that was compatible. And you know, I also understand probably their, their uh, rationale behind. Um, so, but on our side, no, for a moment we don't plan. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, may maybe there are questions from the floor. Sean, do we have questions? Um, yes. Uh, the question is also regarding um, um, activities on the moon, since um, Luxembourg uh, is increasingly getting active in uh, activities on moon, which can, uh, which is another type of celestial body. Uh, but activities on the moon will be increasingly participated by private actors. So a, a question is, how do you see moving forward and um, um, the participation and governance arrangements between national agencies or governments and private actors when it comes to utilizing these resources in space. Mm -hmm. So if we, so currently we are also discussing with NASA about uh, you know our involvement involvement in the Artemis program, and it's clear for us that our involvement will uh, be mainly through the private companies. Um, and also, um, even U.S. government, they also promote uh, public-private par partnerships uh, in their national program. And I think that, you know, with the time, the private companies will be more and more involved, and certain capabilities will re rely on the private industry as well. Just to assure that, you know, probably for, for the agencies, um, it's easier sometimes to rely also on the private industry. Um, and at the same time, uh, from socioeconomic perspective, it's also more interesting. Thank you. Um, a follow-up question would be that then, um, if if it is more attractive for private companies to play a bigger role, um, do we see smaller private companies, or do we see a, a majority? majority of these private companies um, are large, um, famous uh, uh, space companies that we already know of. Thank you. So, you know, there are also perspectives for the smaller companies. So in Luxembourg, we have uh, several companies. Uh, so we have iSpace, Man Electric, which have also plans for, for the lunar activities. And of course, for smaller companies, maybe it's a little bit more complicated but at the same time, there are also niches and some domains in which they can be very active. And if you followed also last year, um, iSpace, they, they, they win the contracts also for supplying space resources and doing their demo missions with NASA. Thank you very it's much. It's a big company. I think, I think in Japan, they're around 70 or 80 people. And in Luxembourg, I, I don't remember exactly, they're around 20. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, we have a question again from the floor. So I would like to just uh, read it out. Um, how do you expect about international governance regarding space-based object resources? Well, Trump decided that should that U.S. should be the first to land on um, the object, hence resources are theirs. I guess this is a popular question, but you could share your perspective with us. Wait, I, I just probably didn't understand the question. Yeah, I would just give me a um, second. It's in the chat, yeah? It's now in the chat. Regarding space. But, okay. Um, <laughs> I mean, this is a national priority for the US. Um, uh, it, it's also a national program, uh, but at the same time, when we were signing Artemis Accords and negotiating the Artemis Accords, uh, for us, it was very important that, for example, the topic of space resources and other topics related to the exploration of space resources are also addressed at the international level, uh, meaning at international forums such as Ion Copus and uh, with other delegations, you know, how we will advance on, on those issues. 
And I think that, um, okay, so US, maybe they were a little bit more in, uh, declarative and you know, more explicit about their plans, but we also saw recently that uh, China, Russia, they also planned those missions. So I do not think, I think that first of all, national missions, national activities, national ambitions will be also um, uh, an element which will provide a more realistic aspect to the discussions we are having now at UN Corpus, especially at legal subcommittee. Um, and it will also probably help to advance faster because there's a real need to talk about those questions. So it will be a very valuable contribution. Mm. Um, I, I also, if I understood you right, um, you want you to make use of space resources first in space, right? And it's water first on, on the moon, probably. Um, and the other, well, it started, I know it started with the ideas of asteroid mining, but it's probably maybe technically still a more visionary approach than, um, than, than real at this time, uh, right? So, um, is this is correct that you um, um, want to want to harvest water first? And um, um, but if there is um, if there is ever a use of resources of space, that's my question now. Um, wouldn't that maybe um, because it's a lot, a lot of platinum, for instance, out there, right? Wouldn't that tip the balance of the resource rarity on Earth that much that it's probably maybe not worth it anymore after after you harvest it? You understand my point, right? I guess. Um, yeah, I understand. So, so everything what is related to platinum group metals or a returning material to Earth, this is something what we see in a very long run, uh, long term vision. Um, we did our value chain and in that value chain study we also identified that first of all we will focus on in-situ resources utilization using them in space uh, on celestial bodies and maybe in the really long long term it will make sense to retur return those um, resources to earth so if our main goal for it's not you know to, to return anything to, to earth for a moment because then you'll have also Diff other questions which will come to the picture and you know we'll have also to think how to solve everything related to the planetary protection uh contamination environmental aspects and so on right. of course there is such a possibility but then you know you have to mature the technologies it's, it's the whole uh, the whole other discussion okay i see there's another question Sam. yes um it's in the chat as well let me read it out meanwhile um when are expected missions that will bring back resources on Earth by an amount sufficiently high that it would make a difference? Or at a rate comparable to the depletion rate, are we talking 2050 or after? A more visionary question. Thank you. I think, of course, it will happen in the next 20, 30, 50 years, you know, it's very hard to say. It will also depends on the needs uh, of the Earth and what problems we, we could solve with uh, using space resources on Earth. But this is something, for example, what I was thinking a little bit less. When we did a study, it was clear that it will be really in a long, long run, because if even we look at other government uh, plans, projects, and so on, uh, there's no real idea to return the uh, material to Earth. So this will be something what will happen really in the long run, as, as we see, maybe um, after 2050. Thank you. Maybe one last question from my side. Um, um, you, uh, maybe it's also some one question you can carry over to the panel at the end of the workshop. I don't know, but how would you see the opportunities of the space resources program and ideas con compared to the sustainability challenges now that we have currently on, on, on the planet. Um, well, how would you relate the two? Would you at all relate them or is there, are there any thoughts on that? Can you just please repeat your question because I lost you for a minute and for a second. Okay, sorry, yeah. No, I, it's, I, I'm sorry, because, you know, there are so many people using Wi-Fi today, and, you know, it starts cracking sometimes. <laughs> yeah. <Sorry. laughs> um, I hope it's not my connection this time. No, I no, it's not yours. <laughs> um, yeah, um, no, the question is, um, how would you relate the space resources vision and plans um, to the current 
sustainability challenge for, for, for planet Earth, so to say. Is, are there any relations between them? Is it, how would you see, could, does it help? Is it too far away? Is it other connections? Something like that. Mm -hmm. So um, if you talk in general about space technology, um, we saw in recent examples, for example, with the COVID crisis, that space in general contributed a lot to addressing those challenges. And space also at the same time contribute to the uh, pressing environmental issues we have currently with the you know, global warming uh, and so on. For space resources vision, we also think that uh, it will support uh, overcoming some earth space challenges because you know, we try to involve also uh, terrestrial mining industry at the same time. We also discuss um, about you know, more pressing issues, how we could transfer one technology from a space sector to terrestrial or other way around from you know, how we could use terrestrial technologies for what we want to do in space. So in one way or another, of course, uh, uh, we, we also think that space resources vision could contribute to socioeconomic aspects, to the economic growth, uh, thinking about you know, creation of jobs, creation of opportunities for young people, so it's a quite a large scope you know, of the challenges we could actually handle with uh, space resources initiatives. Also, you know, avoidance of conflicts. I think that if we only think about a space as a domain for military conflicts, then everything becomes very complicated. But what we're actually promoting here is the peaceful exploration of space. Thank you. So there is one last question from the audience, I guess, Sean. Yes, um, from um, Michael Klorman asking that might there be a place for sustainability in the sense of environmental sustainability in your considerations, for example, including recycling concepts. Oh, I should actually address to my colleagues about the value chain, value chain and the technologies they want to develop here. Um, I think that from the environmental perspective. Um, there are also certain challenges, in, challenges you know, related to the interference with, uh, with the activities of other countries, uh, contamination of, of the space environment itself. Um, so these aspects, of course, will be considered in, in our strategy as well, because we do not want to change space environment to the extent which would be uh, uh, which would be detrimental to the progress, you know, which we can achieve by going to space and doing space resources mining activities. Um, so there will be always you know, a certain balance, balance we will be looking for. Um, and including recycling concepts, I, I really cannot think about an example. <laughs> Maybe to, ju to jump in here, it's um, also I had an idea early when organizing this workshop, maybe to connect the idea of a circular economy because with, with space exploration, because if you go to want to have a base on moon or something mm -hmm. uh, to harvest water, you need uh, you need to have it circular by more or less circular by itself. Of course, it can sustain itself. It can have some supply. Because the environment. Yeah, because of the environment. Yeah. So, but um, that's just uh, maybe it's a bit a bit too visionary at the moment, but it's it needs to be planned. So. <laughs> And at the European Space Agency, there's also a lot of work which is done on these environmental aspects. Um, and you know, when they think about the moon village and about the closed system, they also with they already work on those technologies which address these like environmental aspects uh, and handling them in the most sustainable way. Okay, thank you. Are there any last questions from the speakers or so? Not at the moment. Not at the moment. Then we thank you very much, Dovina, and you will be with us at the panel as well. Thank you in advance for that. And now we have deserved a real coffee break, and um, we will be back in 15 minutes. So if you hear my voice, you may be take your coffee and come back to your screen. And I hope Stefan is with us as well. Yes, there I am. Is. <laughs> okay. So I'll introduce you shortly. Um, 
you have quite some history in space. So I just uh, mentioned your current position. You are senior strategy officer in the Directorate of Human Spaceflight and Robotic Exploration Programs of the European Space Agency, where you coordinate the strategy area for human and robotic exploration. In this role, role he's also representing the Directorate and relevant European and international strategic networks, such as International Space Exploration Coordination Group. Stefan, thank you for being with us, taking the time for being here. And now the floor is yours. Right, thank you very much. Um, I'll have to start sharing my screen, the usual procedure. Right. Remember to put the sound if need be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think we're good to go. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Perfect. So um, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, and, and it's a great opportunity to um, to inform you a bit on, on what our thinking is and what, what we're planning to do. Uh, forward to the moon, Terra Nova and Artemis. Um, Terra Nova is, is the new name of the um, European Exploration uh, Program. Um, and, and what I plan to do in, in the coming 15, 20 minutes is uh, to update you what we are planning to do uh, until the end of this decade, 2030, but then also to try to give an outlook what we would be hoping to do after that. Um, and, and the moon is prominent here on, on this slide. Um, but if I also tell you a bit of, uh, about the nature of our program, um, actually the moon is not a self-standing uh, destination. Um, our program, Terra Nova, is, is a multi-destination, three destinations, and the destinations are interlinked. They have their own merits and, and own reasons why to go there, uh, but we go to one destination also in support of the other destinations. Um, on, on this slide, you see what our plans are until the end of this decade, and most of it is uh, approved, so missions that uh, are under development and, and planned to, to be executed or already on, ongoing. Um, and, and obviously, you see the three destinations, uh, low Earth orbit with the International Space Station, uh, the Moon, where um, Orion and, and Gateway are uh, on the way to be um, uh, launched. Uh, we're studying, and, and that is not yet approved, a, a logistic lander uh, that will go to the surface, uh, but also a cislunar transfer vehicle. Um, and then uh, the last destination, Mars, uh, of course, with ExoMars, we're already there with, with our trace gas orbiter. Uh, we're planning a, a rover to go there uh, next year. Uh, and we have an approved sample return campaign uh, in cooperation with NASA, uh, which, which is a huge mission under preparation. Um, if I go to the first destination first, Earth, then uh, space care is a central team uh, within our agency uh, and space care it's both caring about space but also caring about earth um, and and we heard already today uh, quite some references to what space can do for earth uh, and that's central in, in our agency um, now to go to space uh, one crucial element is being able to go there, uh, having the capability. Uh, and and uh, we're all very happy that um, with Dragon and, and uh, very soon also with Starliner, uh, we will have an increased capability. And, and we feel that immediately also uh, in, in our operations and in, in our activities, because with, with this new capability of Dragon, uh, also the crew uh, on board ISS in, is increasing uh, and we can do more um, uh, in terms of science and, and research, technology, etc., cetera. Um, it's also um, still continuing, showing this global cooperation. And just take the example of this month in April, um, we've seen uh, nine April uh, Russian Soyuz to the ISS with uh, one American and, and two Russian uh, cosmonauts. Uh, Mid-April 17, um, there's the return uh, of, of a different US Russian trio. And uh, this week uh, we had the launch of, of this um, um, dragon with, with a Japanese, a Frenchman, and, and two um, Americans. So truly international cooperation. 
Um, now, what is the relevance for society of having our astronauts in LEO? Um, I will not dwell too much on that, but the experience gained by the astronauts as such is already a, a capital, an important capital, um, because they their experience, they can share it. And um, to name the overview effect is, is one of the things, but they're also ambassadors. Uh, they're symbols for, for our um, society and role models. Um, and our astronaut, uh, Thomas Pesquet, who was or on, on this crew dragon, um, he, he's also an ambassador. And his mission, this is his mission patch. His mission is called Alpha, um, because it's the beginning of a new era uh, for Europe with, with the first um, astronaut on a commercial flight, and that you see central in the mission patch. But the color coding around it uh, is also not a coincidence. Those are really mirroring the sustainable development goals. So he has a very high in his uh, uh, program, uh, this, this uh, sense of value, uh, what can do space for, for Earth. Um, and it's not just a slogan. Um, he became uh, a goodwill ambassador for, for the Food and Agriculture Organization uh, last week. Um, you, you see there the two uh, icons of two SDGs, very small, but it's for climate change and for um, food. Um, but there's more. And, and it's also practical. It's not only being a symbol or a um, um, ambassador, uh, but we can do things. And, and this is a very concrete example I, I want to show from the ISS. You see again Thomas Pesquet, but during his uh, previous mission in, in 2017, where he's handling uh, biology samples in Melfi, which is uh, a, a freezer, minus 80 degrees, uh, using a very specific technology, a Brighton engine. Um, and, and the company that has built this freezer 15 years ago, actually since two or three years, are commercializing this technology on LNG tankers, liquid natural gas tankers. Uh, and, and what they do, they, they reliquify boil off gas, gas that is otherwise vented in the air. Uh, they reliquify it uh, so, so that it's not vented in the air. Uh, and this has an economic impact um, also for the company providing this technology, of course, but also a climate impact because the gas that it was vented in the air, though, it's, it's a greenhouse gas. Um, and since uh, the company has been installing those machines on the ships, uh, they estimate they're saving the equivalent of, of more than 100,000 tons of CO2 uh, per year. Um, so that, that's a very concrete uh, return. Um, 15 years after the installation of the MEFI in ISIS, uh, so sometimes there's a, a big time between seeing results, but still uh, it, it's there. The moon very prominent uh, in the title and the title slide, but uh, yet I first want to go to Mars as well, just to come back on the Rosalind Franklin Rover, um, a very complex machine, ex exobiology, um, very interesting. Um, this is in the clean room. And I wanted to show this picture, especially also for the humans in the clean room. Um, the equipment or the protection they use, it's not for themselves, but it's to protect the rover um, uh, because they want to do science. And it's very important that uh, we have a clean rover without any life going to Mars if we want to detect Mars. So it's um, for the sake of science, but at the same time also for the sake of um, planetary protection, because uh, if um, you do, do not clean the rover, you can bring uh, contaminants to, to Mars, uh, and that may also have an impact there. Um, so it's, it's this dual um, benefit uh, of, of this um, um, clean room. Um, this rover is waiting to be launched. Uh, it's, it's developed, it's built, um, and the plan is to have it launched uh, in the next launch window in, in 2022. Um, at the same time, we're working on, on the Mars sample return mission. Uh, it's, it's a campaign. It actually started already with the rover Percy, which has been sent by NASA uh, and is, is now uh, tra traversing uh, Mars, that will collect samples. And, and the campaign will 
um, will return the samples to Earth. And, and one of the elements um, ESA is um, building is the Earth return orbiter. And, and that's uh, an orbiter that will catch in Mars orbit the sample uh, that will have been launched by, um, by NASA. Um, and I show this small video to show the complex operation. And, and this operation is, is very relevant also for in-orbit servicing, for example. What we learn here is, is autonomously capturing and removing non-cooperative satellites. Uh, that's what we heard this morning, very important. Um, well, what we do around Mars is has direct um, consequences or, or uh, relevance for what we need Earth. Here you see him, the, the orbiter returning to Earth. You saw the propulsion, solar electric propulsion. Um, and then the last step is returning the sample to Earth. And then th that's the reverse protection. We also have to protect uh, Earth from, from this sample and, and uh, possible uh, contaminant. Uh, so this, this uh, object is very well encapsulated. Um, and uh, will be opened very carefully, uh, not, not to contaminate Earth. Uh, and that's also why the last maneuver of the big spacecraft is actually to, to go away from Earth on, on a kind of graveyard orbit, uh, because we, we certainly want to avoid that the, the satellite is crashing into Earth and, and possibly bringing uh, contaminants. And actually this protection of Earth brings me to the moon. Uh, but first, more than 50 years back, here you see that also already at that time, 69, uh, contamination of Earth was an issue. And, and you see here President Nixon uh, welcoming the Apollo 11 crew uh, in, in the Pacific on, on a ship in, in a mobile quarantine facility um, because they had to sit there um, for a certain period of time before they could uh, really come back. Uh, with their foot on Earth. You, you see Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and, and Michael Collins in, in, in the middle. That was more than 50 years ago. This is a kind of overview of the plans uh, of the international community in the coming 10 years, both institutional and commercial. Um, so it, it's going to be busy, uh, that, that is for sure. Um, and what will ESA do? Well, for that, I first go back to uh, a slide that has already been shown today. It's from the Global Exploration Roadmap uh, and specifically an addendum on, on the surface um, the surface scenario. Um, I will not go to, into details, but the planning here from 26 um, international space agencies is to go there, uh, boots on the moon first, phase one, uh, then uh, build up capabilities uh, in exploration and mobility, and then come to a phase where sustainable exploration of, of the moon is possible. So it, it's a stepwise approach, uh, but clearly with the vision not just to go there and then uh, turn away, but create a sustainable lunar expo uh, exploration. Um, and, and more in detail, the goals of this first um, surface scenario uh, devised by ISEC-G, um, well, there are 12, 12 um, high-level objectives, and, and obviously capability building is, is one of, of it, of them, um, but um, uh, there, there is, of course, more, and, and some are really related to, to sustainability. There is a demonstration of in-situ resource production, um, but there are also things like engage the public, uh, implement new commercial arrangements, uh, create collaboration opportunities for international partners. Uh, and, and we have some metrics for those objectives. Uh, and, and one of the metrics in collaboration is to have more than 100 um, um, countries involved in, in exploration of the moon. Um, now, this is a theory. This is what the global exploration roadmap across all uh, agencies um, um, says, and, and those agencies include China, Russia, um, the States, of course, and, and European countries, Asian countries. Um, the Chinese and the Russians are planning for uh, an international lunar resource station that can be part of it. Um, the Americans, the US is planning for the Artemis missions. Um, and, and this is a bit exemplified on this slide, the first steps. Um, there are the CLIPS missions, small landers, uh, 
which will bring small payloads. Viper is a rover. Um, there's a CubeSat plant. And then we have the real Artemis missions with the SLS uh, system, the first uh, launch this year, uh, followed by the first elements of, of the gateway. Uh, and then Artemis 2 and 3 are then the crewed missions, first in orbit and the third one on the surface. Uh, on the surface, the, the plan is 2024. That will most likely shift a little bit to the right. Um, but what is important, it's a, again a cooperative um, endeavor. And actually here you see the Orion system. It's composed of two elements, the crew part, the shiny uh, part here on, on the left side, but also a service module. And the service module is European built. It's provided by the European Space Agency. Um, it's a crucial element, of course, the engines uh, provides um, the climate control, uh, power, the solar panels. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a crucial part. And it's actually for the first time that the Americans uh, allow um, uh, another country to be on the critical part of, of, of their exploration mission. Uh, which, which is, we're really proud of that. Uh, and, and it shows how much uh, European industry has been evolving and gaining capabilities and, and credibilities. Um, the gateway is, is the other element. Uh, you see here on the left side, again, Orion, dock to the gateway. Um, it's again, international cooperation and the role of Europe is also very important. Um, and uh, I'm not uh, trying to inflate that, but um, probably 50% of the infrastructure of the gateway will come from Europe. Um, and on, on the right side, this module with the solar panels, it's the propulsion module, it's built in the States, it's the first element. But then the second element, the halo, which is an American element, uh, habitation and logistic module, actually this, uh, infrastructure or the, the, the shell here is built in Europe. So the housing comes from Europe. And then we will further contribute uh, our own modules, uh, a habitation module, the international habitation module, IHAP, um, and Esprit, which is um, a suit of, of um, capabilities in communication, refueling, uh, docking ports, etc. cetera. Um, so again, a quite prominent role for Europe. Further in our plans, and this is under study and, and needs to be approved at the next ministerial conference, is a landing capability, um, a logistic lander, so not crude, but for payloads and, and uh, in support of human missions. Um, here you see a, a sketch of it. Uh, it would be capable of delivering 1.5 ton of payload to the surface, uh, six meter tall, um, and um, right, an autonomous capability for Europe, both for our own purposes, but also to support international cooperation. But then the big thing is, how do we get humans to the surface? And um, very recently, last week, NASA selected uh, for the first mission, um, their um, human landing system. And I just returned here to the gateway. Actually, this is what they foresaw as a human landing system docked to the gateway. But actually, it will look more like this. It's the starship of, of Elon Musk's uh, SpaceX, um, and it, it's huge. Um, it is uh, also surprising, uh, this selection, in terms of what they were used um, to do and, and what they had themselves in mind in the first place. Um, and, and this puts a bit into perspective uh, how the, this landing system compares to the competitors um, you see the two other competitors um, uh, next to it, and, and the scale is completely different. Uh, this is a 50 meter tall uh, starship. You see the small astronaut here. Now, there are a lot of things to say about this, and, and from a sustainability perspective, um, one thing is financially, it is more sustainable because the private company is investing or co-investing a lot more. Uh, but from the environmental um, perspective, uh, you may do more with less flights, yes, uh, but to land such a beast on, on the surface of the moon that has also implications in terms of dust uh, and other things. So th there's still a, lit, uh, a lot to be um, done uh, in that respect. Um, one element which is particularly interesting is this starship will be launched in um, low earth orbit will be refueled there. And then 
an Orion capsule will bring the astronauts in the Starship to then the Starship going to the surface of the moon. So one aspect, this refueling is, is very interesting because now it will be refueled with a separate flight coming from Earth. But one could easily envisage that uh, um, future refueling could be done by materials from the moon, uh, making uh, this exploration more sustainable. Um, this is a slide referring again to Isaac G. We published, or Isaac G published uh, on, on the 21st of April, a very extensive report on in situ resource utilization and technology gap assessment. Uh, so it's uh, available on their website. Uh, and I would recommend everyone interested in, in uh, reading it. It has a lot of elements uh, also beyond technology. And in the previous talk um, from Luxembourg, uh, it was already mentioned, um, research on, on ISRU is very important. That's why also we cooperate with Luxembourg and share this, this theme. Uh, here you see um, a picture, which is a result from some of ground research where regolith or a regolith simulant here on, on the left side has been turned into um, metal or uh, metallics. Um, and, and the oxygen has been extracted out of it. And that you can, of course, not see, but that has been trapped. So it's a process to turn regolith into oxygen and metals. And, and very interesting, this was a process, a terrestrial process, to make um, the uh, metallurgic industry more clean because this process is carbon free um, and it's at lower temperatures than, than the classical ones, so requiring less energy. Um, so the products are metals and the byproduct that was thrown away on Earth was oxygen. But in, in our situation, of course, on the moon, the oxygen is not uh, something you throw away, but something you carefully uh, capture and, and use. Um, the metals on Earth, you can also use those metals in space. And, and one application um, is, is fuels, again, fuels. Um, solid rocket boosters are, are using metals and burn metals. Um, and, and we have experience with that. And what you see here in front of you is an experiment of burning metals in microgravity in a sounding rocket with the objective to see how we can also use that on Earth. And if we can burn metals on Earth and use that as a source of energy, that would be maybe a new type of fuel for the future, carbon free, because the, the, the only rest product of, of burning metals is, is rust uh, and, and that can be easily recycled. Now I'm almost at the end of my talk. Now I, I go to what beyond the current plans. Uh, and, and very recently we had a new director general, um, Josef Arschbacher, who uh, uh, take off, took office uh, and he has published an agenda for ESA, Agenda 25. And I will not go into the details of the agenda, but I just picked two ambitious he formulated for exploration uh, for Europe uh, and uh, I want to stress those are uh, suggestions or recommendations or uh, visions from our director general. Uh, so that, that's not decided and, and a, an approved program, but he put it on paper. He, he throws it to our politicians as an ambition for Europe to have the first European uh, setting foot on the moon uh, in 29 and having three Europeans on the moon in 35 to stress the sustainability and not the one off. Um, and for Mars, he um, projects in 2035 to have the first um, European setting foot on Phobos, uh, which is uh, a satellite of, of a moon of, of Mars. Um, so I think those, those are very challenging, but very um, inspiring ambitions. Uh, and, and I hope this will sprinkle a, a very um, good discussion and reflection on, on the European side. Um, in, in terms of what we, where we want to go in, in the future. Um, and, and then my last slide, uh, I come back to uh, Michael Collins. Actually, um, he was in, in the Apollo um, 11 mission. He didn't uh, go to the surface of the moon in that mission. Um, he stayed in, in, in the command module, um, but he, he passed away yesterday um, uh, and, and it's a very nice personality. You can see it from this picture. Um, and, and I want to throw one of his sentences here uh, in, into the audience. Uh, exploration is not a choice, really. 
it's an imperative um, because I've been showing examples how um, exploration can benefit Earth um, and, and why we could do it. Um, but actually, we also do it because we want to do it and we want to go there out. Uh, and, and this balance between what does it bring for Earth or and, and the balance, do we want to go there for the sake of going there, um, is, is something probably to be to, to reflect on as well. Um, and with this, uh, I thank you very much for listening to me and I, uh, I'm open to questions. Thank you so much, uh, Stefan. Um, yeah, the, the, actually your last slide answered my uh, my first question about um, that I had, how you, uh, the European Space Agency sees the importance of space exploration and space flight for um, humanity. Um, but you indicated a little bit of that. I have another more technical or legal question. It's maybe just a little small one while we are gathering other questions. Um, you mentioned the competition between, I think it's SpaceX, Blue Origin, Blue Origins, and the third one for the uh, lunar landing module. Um, and uh, now there's, uh, I read that the, this decision was for SpaceX, but it's challenged. Does such legal challenges delay somehow the process? Do we now have to wait what comes out of such a jurisdiction or is it? Yeah. Uh, um, I think we had some some exchanges with NASA um, on, of course, the selection because it's it's uh, very important for the program. And since we saw so intertwined with our Artemis, uh, it, it the implications uh, are important. Uh, from from a legal perspective, what I understood from NASA is that this um, will delay the the process with 100 days. They have to take um, certain legal procedures into account, and apparently the impact. Uh, is, is 100 days, assuming that um, the the request is not honored. Of course, if if the appeal is is uh, found um, uh, correct, then uh, it will have much more implications uh, than than 100 days. But if um, they can continue with the with SpaceX uh, after the appeal, then the impact would be something like three months. So all be all, not not to. Uh, not too bad. Um, but one important thing to, to realize is that um, SpaceX has been selected for the first demonstration of a landing uncrewed on, on the surface, and then the first demonstration of a landing with crew on the moon. Um, that does not mean that NASA will then for the future service and, and, and the sustainable exploration um, only rely on SpaceX. Um, for that service, um, competition will will be reinstated. So other bidders will will already will again get the chance to uh, to get in that. Um, because in the first place, uh, the idea of NASA was to select at least two uh, companies for fully developing the service, similar to what they did with Crew for for low Earth orbit with Starliner and and uh, SpaceX. Thank you. Um, Sean, there are already questions from the audience, I guess. Yes. Um, yeah, please allow me to ask the first question from the floor. Uh, will the one who will visit Phobos come back to Earth? Again, sorry. So, well uh, will, so I, I wasn't so sure um, about the question, will the one who will be visit Phobos come back to Earth? I guess, um, I guess um, it is in terms of the the, the spacecraft or the um, robots that are uh, being sent there or the astronauts. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Not yeah. Very clear. So uh, I, I can can easily answer that. Um, as an agency, we'll never send astronauts one way ticket to to Mars or any other destination. Um, and, and our Mars sample return, actually, it's uh, a mission that will bring back samples, and that's the science component, but the technology demonstration of going there and coming back and bringing back something from Mars, it's also a first, uh, and it's, it's an analog first demo um, at, at a small scale, uh, of course, of, of such a return. Um, I hope that answers the question. Yes, um, thank you. The second question, will an acceleration of the so far mentioned um, activities for humans in space um, actually possible? 
so I guess um, the, the question basically refers to all these quick developments that's going on in terms of the missions, um, um, but um, technically, uh, with all these visions in mind, are these actually uh, um, possible, technically and theoretically possible? Um, well, here that's, that's a very good question and, and there is, and, and that's a personal interpretation, but um, there are two actors, there are the institutional actors, commercial actors, um, and, and typically an institution or an agency like, like ESA, the European Space Agency, uh, we need to take into account um, the wishes and, and uh, the mandate we get from our member states. We have many member states. So in, in formulating um, ambitions and visions, uh, we have to be a little bit careful and make sure that we're uh, inclusive of all our members. Um, that means that we can also sometimes not be as sharp as then a commercial company. And if you have an Elon Musk or um, uh, Bezos, like uh, Andreas in, in his um, opening uh, statements mentioned, they can have very visionary, very long-term um, um, visions and, and formulate them and, and make them public um, because they do it on their own capacity in their own name um, and, and they don't have to take into account uh, any opinion from anyone else. Um, so that makes that when we say something, it's more carefully thought through. And, and if we say something, we also believe we can do it and it can be done. If a commercial entity says something, um, I would not say it's not possible, but it may, may take more time than what they currently envisage or, or have them. Um, and, and to give one simple example is uh, going to Mars um, with Starship uh, in, in a few years, what, what, is, what is the ambition uh, of Elon Musk with crew um, requires also a life support system. Um, but that is something where he has not thought of uh, at all uh, in his mind that that is something which he will buy uh, on the spot um, but uh, I can guarantee you that's not uh, that easy. Yeah. Okay, before we move on to the next talk, um, there's one last question, I think. Um, yes, yes. Um, um, is most of the exploration, are most of the exploration plans centered around anthropogenic benefits? Um, are there any plans to conserve some parts of Moon, Mars, the way they are, similar to conservation or uh, the national parks here on Earth? Mm. That's also a very good question. It's not really within my competence, and I would even say not within that of the European Space Agency. Um, we support our member states in that, and, and uh, the member states are actually the, the counterparts in those discussions uh, within COPOS. I know there are, but perhaps there are other people here in, in, in the workshop that are better placed to answer this, but there are initiatives um, uh, like for Moonkind, et cetera, that are looking into heritage and want to protect, for instance, the Apollo landing sites, uh, et cetera. So there's certainly um, thinking in, in that direction, um, but I'm, I'm not fully aware what the latest is in that, uh, in that respect. Okay, but we will have you on the panel as well at the end of the workshop. So thank you, Stefan, for this delightful and, um, well, um, ex presentation of explorative means and aims. Um, yeah, so we, I think we need to move on to stay in time. And uh, the next, our next speaker is Emmanuel David. Are you there, Emmanuel? Yeah, wonderful. Yes. So I shortly introduce you and then I hand over the floor to yours. Um, Emmanuel David is the executive manager of the EPFL Space Center. The Space Center, also called eSpace, is an interdisciplinary unit responsible for the federation of space activities at the school and co lead a re uh, um, yeah, and she co leads a research initiative on sustainable space logistics. Emmanuel has 10 years experience in space transportation academia, agency, and industry from pre-development projects up to launch operations. She holds space engineering degrees both from the University of Technology of Compiègne, France, and the Technical University of Braunschweig, Germany. And there we go. Emmanuel, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much. So I guess you are all seeing my screen currently. This is correct? Yes, we do. Perfect. So thank you, Andreas, for the very nice introduction. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here today. Uh, and uh, I want to also say that it's a really great lineup of uh, speakers. Uh, very interesting talks and actually it's going to make also my presentation, my job easier because a lot of topics have been already introduced. Um, <clears throat> so I'd like to start my talk as um, uh, to show what is an example of uh, space logistics today and why we talk about space logistics. Uh, so here we see um, three disp satellites dispenser on, on this first slide uh, of uh, two of uh, so the so-called la large constellation that uh, Thomas Schildnex uh, uh, introduced this morning. Uh, we see here uh, the OneWeb dispenser where you have 34 satellites on, on this dispenser. You see a picture in the middle of a Starlink uh, launch where you have 60 satellites on it. And here on the right, you see a um, picture of a dispenser with 53 satellites from the small satellite mission service that has been <clears throat> launch uh, on the Vega rocket uh, last year in September. Uh, so we see that uh, so those incredible missions have been launched in the last two years. And we see that, indeed, there is also uh, some new infrastructure that have been developed or means in, a, in order to be able to launch all those, uh, those new the, the, those, those satellites. <clears throat> and this is one building block of uh, space logistics. Um, what I want to show here, and actually, it's I think it's a really good synthesis of everything that you, you've, you've um, been listening to today. So I will not go too much in details, but I want to show you also to take a minute to take a step back and to look what is the space economy today? What are we doing in space? So we talked uh, just before there was the presentation uh, from the Luxembourg Space Agency on the uses of in-situ resource utilization on the moon. Just before me, from ESA, the also exploration roadmap, uh, how to get back to the to to the moon, also missions to go uh, to to Mars, and then we also saw uh, all the application around Earth, also by by Gaëtan, all the impact on Earth. So th there is a space infrastructure which is there, and which is growing, and which will be even more growing in the next. Oh, sorry, my slide is yeah, need to find out. Uh, which is growing even uh, even faster, and and we talked also that there's going to be human space settlement um, on the moon, uh, space tourism also possibly, uh, also Mars habitat. Uh, we're going to be exploiting resources, even maybe have uh, solar power space stations, and also there's going to be development of very large uh, space infrastructure. Uh, like the Moon Deep Space Gateway, um, large, very large telescope, and so very big infrastructure. So there is a mean, uh, there is really a need to 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 find a way to to put all this this infrastructure into space, and <clears throat> but also there is a need to make it uh, in a sustainable way. Um, there has been two several talks also this morning on the problematic of space debris. So I don't want to. Uh, go too much into this, but we know that uh, we see that the space economy is growing, the infrastructure is there, but there are still there are some problems. There are too many objects. There are some protect some orbits that needs to be protected, like in low Earth orbit, and 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 ge the geo belt also, and <clears throat> these topics also needs to be assessed, and that's why also we talk about space sustainability, and space sustainability. Here I wrote the. Uh, the definition from the uh, Committee on Peaceful uh, Use of Outer Space. <clears throat> and uh, the definition of space sustainability is the long-term sustainability of outer space activities is defined as the ability to maintain the conduct of space activities indefinitely into the future in a manner that realizes the objective of equitable access to the benefit of exploration and use of outer space for peaceful purposes in order to meet the needs of the present generation while preserving the outer space environment for future generation. The, I, I, 
I underline two, two parts of these definitions. Um, is one is to maintain the conduct of space activities indefinitely into the future. So this is something that uh, I want to take, that we, we take with us uh, to uh, in terms of space sustainability and also the needs of, uh, of the present, uh, to meet the need of the present generation while preserving also the outer space environment for the future generation. And future generation as we're uh, a university and uh, we also have a, a space technology minor at EPFL. Um, that's, um, we are very, um, we, we really need to, we are really committed also to, to preserve the environment for, for our future generations. So that being said, what is EPFL uh, Space Center doing about it? And um, what are we doing uh, in the context of sustainable space logistics? So in 2019, we introduced a research initiative on sustainable space logistics. This initiative is financed by uh, the, the Swiss Space Office. So the, the uh, yeah, from the Swiss Space Office. Um, sustainable space logistics, um, I want to um, go with you through a um, few definitions so you can understand better also the, the concept. Uh, so logistics per se is the management of flow of things between the point of origin and the point of consumption, including also the end of life. Meaning is uh, need also to think space missions uh, from the origin point, meaning when you, you, you designed, you built on Earth, doing the mission in space. For example, you go to a moon mission, but also thinking about the end of life of your mission. Um, <clears throat> It's not anymore that, that you go and then you, you do perform your mission and then you just leave the hardware there. Uh, it's really to, to think the end-to-end the -end mission. What is important is that also to understand the physics of space uh, in terms of uh, it's very different as on Earth. Here in the middle, you see this, this graph with the energy scale. Uh, it's a, the energy scale map of the near Earth space. So you see here, um, you have the Earth's surface, and for example, to go to low Earth orbit, you you, you need a certain amount of, of energy, which is high, and then you will need a, a lower amount of energy to, to go to, to geo, um, even though the distance is maybe smaller. And this is also something very particular to take into account into space is that the, the physics is not the same as, as on Earth. That's why it's important to think about space logistics and, and to really include the, this notion, the, the two notions together. So that's how we came, the, the definition of space logistics is the theory and practice of driving space system design for operability managing the flow of material services and information needed throughout the life cycle. And indeed, um, adding on that, we are looking into space logistics with the eye of sustainability. Um, I think everyone is here because we are all advocates of uh, sustainability, so I don't need to <laughs> explain this more. Um, <clears throat> but indeed, we don't want to redo in space the same mistakes that we have been uh, doing on Earth. And so that's why we are uh, strongly committed to, to this vision. So some keywords that could illustrate sustainable space logistics or key technologies can be in-orbit servicing, refueling, reusable launchers, constellation deployment, resource extraction, in-orbit assembly, uh, debris removal. <clears throat> now I will um, present to you a few activities that are ongoing uh, at EPFL uh, to, to illustrate our um, research initiative. So the objectives of our initiative is really to create and support research initiatives to drive innovation and contribute to the Swiss know-how in space logistics, to build also communities around selected research subjects, and also to develop talents and, and inspire new vocation. The <clears throat> We have set up a research flow at uh, eSpace, so EPFL Space Center, <clears throat> which is, we have the two approach, the top down and, and the bottom up. So here I represent more the top down approach, meaning that we are looking at uh, formal scenario planning processes to understand what are the possible scenarios of the space sector by 2040, 2040. Meaning what if we have a moon valley 
And what is the technology roadmap to get to this point? The idea behind that is to look at different scenarios because you cannot say this is going to be how things are going to be. We cannot go to only one direction. We have to be ready to go to, for different scenarios and to understand what are the different needs for those scenarios. For that, we have also developed two tools. We have two, two main tools uh, in, in our center. One, we are working on logistic flow modeling. It's an internal tool um, to do some space logistics optimization and to understand trade the to perform trade-offs for space logistics scenarios. And currently, we focus uh, on constellation deployment and on orbit servicing scenarios. The second one is we have a concurrent design facility, uh, which is a facility to gather different experts in order to perform design. Uh, design studies or concepts trade-off in order to find the, the best design for a, so for a mission. The bottom-up approach, uh, as I mentioned, is that we, we want to push also key technologies that will um, enable uh, sustainable space logistics. I will present to you a few examples of te technologies development that are ongoing within EPFL labs. <coughs> Here on the left, um, we show it's, well, it's an old picture of the ClearSpace mission, but we are very glad to have a partnership with ClearSpace and to uh, have the two lab, the group of laboratories, one working on the relative navigation um, using, uh, in order to, um, to help using uh, artis artificial intelligence to understand the attitude of the target satellite. So in this case, it's going to be VESPA for the CLI space mission in order to give the good information for the chaser uh, to come and to capture the, the uncooperative target. And we also have a group of two laboratories, the laboratory LSMS and ReAssist, to work on the capture system concept validations. So to understand what is the best strategy for the arms to close around the target. Other ongoing projects uh, at EPFL uh, is that we have here, you can see in the bottom, some um, uh, the laboratory uh, of reconfigurable robots that works on origami robots, meaning to develop a set of, of uh, robots that could go for exploration and have different uses. And we all know that it's important to lower uh, the mass for, for exploration and, and and, and to be uh, as versatile as possible. On the top right, here is a project also uh, co-financed with, with the European Space Agency at the laboratory LPAC of uh, Advanced Composite Materials uh, to work on design for demise in order to for satellites during re-entry to <clears throat> complete the breakup in order to avoid that any uh, pieces of the satellite would uh, reach Earth. And here, at last but not least, we have here also a project uh, on in-situ resource utilization and additive manufacturing. Uh, the goal being to understand when doing additive manufacturing with lunar regolith, what would be the, uh, property, the, mat the, property the property of the material. So th there's very, yeah, um, few, few projects ongoing. Uh, within EPFL to, to, assist, to enable sustainable space logistics. One of the goals of our uh, initiative, as I mentioned, is also to, to build up a community around the thematic of sustainable space logistics. And we were very happy to host in February the first Sustainable Space Logistics Digital Symposium. It was online and uh, a few of the speakers that came to, uh, that were at our Symposium are, uh, were also at, uh, presenting today. So that shows that really there is a clear connection between uh, what Andreas is trying to do and what we are trying to do. Um, <clears throat> so the symposium was around three days and I would like also to share with you the outcome of this uh, symposium. And then if you are so willing to learn more about what happened or what have been said, uh, all the videos are uh, available on our YouTube channel. Uh, so, uh, and here the QA code, if you want, is to uh, access our YouTube channel. So the key outcome, uh, I think, so the first day, uh, it was 
more about the, the status and, and what is the situation today. And I think everyone agreed that there, were, there is no plan B and there is really an urgency to act around space sustainability. Uh, we had also some presentation with concrete, so uh, top-down example from the UN, so the United Nations, the International Astronomical Federation, and also from the ESA, uh, that there are initiatives top-down to address the, the, the issue. But then also we had a um, round discussion um, with some, I would say, non-space uh, people. Uh, and then they also ask for more transparency on what is the sustainability of a space mission. And they also uh, ask for more communication for the citizen around the topic. So I think this is something that I took from, from this day is that um, everyone in the space community is committed around uh, space sustainability. Uh, I guess the citizens are also aware of it and they want, but they want to learn more about that. So a message here is that to everyone listening today, you should spread the word out and, and talk to, to the people around you and tell them. The second day was uh, more focused on, on space logistics and and uh, what what is uh, currently ongoing in the in in the topics. And we had a very interesting presentation from uh, Professor De Vec from MIT, who also uh, uh, presented uh, the status of uh, the the research in space logistics, how to define new logistics network and op optimization of resources. What was really interesting is we also had a presentation of uh, an expert from DHL, also looking at the thematics. So that's uh, really good to see that also non-space actors are also uh, starting to look at space logistics and want also to contribute. And this is very important that uh, to get also this knowledge from like, uh, I would say Earth-led uh, research and to apply it to, to space. And what also um, is, what came out is that also new space is also driving the shift of, of space logistics or so sustainable space logistics. As I showed you in the first slide with the diff those platform that were example um, <clears throat> to, to bring also uh, all those, um, uh, I would say all the satellites to space to build the infrastructure and they are testing their business model. And we hope that in the five, next five, 10 years, we're going to see the uh, success of those business models. And then the last day of this, uh, this symposium, we try to look uh, in the future, what is needed to be done. And, um, and also we gathered also some inputs from the next generations, meaning from students of EPFL and also from students and young professionals from the Space Generation Advisory Council. Um, I will not uh, go too much in detail, but indeed people mentioned that there is a need from a legal uh, framework. It's a very complex uh, in terms of regulation at the national and international level, also at the industry level. And there is also a huge challenge around the dual use of the technologies that are used. Uh, and indeed, I mentioned this discussion between uh, Claude Nicolier, our favorite Swiss astronaut and EPFL students and uh, the SGAC members. And uh, it was really, uh, I would say, a discussion full of hope as uh, we see that the next generation, people who are coming, who are studying now, they are aware about the urgency and they're really highly committed about the topic. So to conclude uh, for my presentation, um, here is a, a image showing that um, you can see that the space traffic is dense. Um, I really like the joke, who say we can't reverse global warming? I hope this will not be the solution to reverse global warming. And, <clears throat> And I want to say that I, I really um, also personally uh, uh, um, encourage also the, this uh, this initiative to 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 ask to add a new SDG goal of uh, space environment and to really include uh, space into the 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 I would say Earth system that uh, because in fact it's a very I would say the limit the Kármán limit at 100 kilometers is is it's, it's not something physical. And there is really a need to, to take the, this whole environment as a whole. Thank you very much. And um, I, I'm open to any questions. 
Thank you so much, Emmanuel. Um, I much enjoyed the logistics symposium and um, yeah, I remember it very well. Um, do we have, um, but do we have questions from the audience already? Um, no, but maybe they, they, they always have the delay. So um, thank you for, for supporting the idea of an SDG 18. We will discuss this also at the very end of the workshop a bit. Um, yeah, uh, it was interesting to see the different aspects of logistics you explore there and uh, to have it in this, that we need to have it in a sustainable ma manner means for me two things that first of all, there is enough traffic and action that we need to think about it. And then it also maybe to some degree means that there's also commercial activity because sustainability is somehow it's always an economic dimension as well. But um, um, so that that is new and um, yeah, so you you said at the end you support, maybe that's a question I have, um, environmental uh, aspects. Um, how would you balance the two the pillars of sustainability? That's, I mean, there's a third pillar, the social one, then there's the economic one and the ecological. And um, do you have an, any ideas on how, what would you, how would you deal with the may potential tension between these pillars? Yeah, it's not an easy question, I know. <laughs> that's, that's a good one. Yeah, I could. Uh, uh, well, for me, I think the three pillars, um, I would not see them as pillars because they are really linked together. Uh, because when we talk about sustainability, it's we always think about the ecological aspect, but it's also economic sustainability. And one part of, of it also is that uh, you don't want space. So far, space activities have been, for example, very government led or pushed and we, you see this shift of commercial activities so it means that you want also have to have activities that are sustainable in the way that it should not be always government or taxpayer money to to enable this of course it's, it can be a push and <clears throat> so that's a, an aspect of course of sustainability but also indeed there is this um, more um, yeah environmental way that uh, when you make something economically sustainable, it should also limit the impact on the environment there. Uh, so I think, yeah, it's all linked together. Yeah, you're, you're totally right. It's better to speak of dimensions than of pillars. It's uh, because it sounds like the separate areas, which they aren't. Yeah, you're totally right there. Um, Sean, do we have um, questions from the from the audience now? Yes. Um, first of all, hi, Emmanuel. Very nice to see you. Yes. <laughs> Um, I, I have a question myself, but uh, I will first um, 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 pose this question from the floor from Hubert Meisinger. Um, what is the ambition of DHL to be part of this endeavor? Um, so I cannot answer in, uh, on uh, the um, behalf of DHL, but I can tell you what I understood from that talk. Um, so DHL, they are um, already part, I would say, of the endeavor because they do logistics on Earth for some space companies, meaning so they, they understand what are the constraints. They bring, uh, I would say, space um, spacecraft from a place A to a place B on Earth. And indeed, they are looking also... Uh, how is the status to, today of space logistics and how you can also make the comparison between um, how they see logistics and how is space logistics. And for that, it was really interesting, the talk, and I encourage the person who asked the question to, to look at the, the video uh, to, to see what is the view of DHL on space logistics. Thank you. Um, so, um, the, the question that I'm interested with is that um, because we have seen from the history that um, EPFL had successfully uh, spun off um, um, clear space, uh, for instance, and that was a really a, a big success um, from my point of view. And now with regard to sustainable space logistics, um, how do you see the development of this into the future? Um, would we uh, um, um, follow a same trajectory that at some point um, we we, we try to incentivize this sort of in-orbit servicing. So uh, if I understand correctly, you're asking more about the future of the initiative on sustainable space logistics, correct? Yeah, so <clears throat> um, I would say first we're um, 
the initiative is kind of young, so we are really trying to, we started a few projects and we want to have those projects go through and we really to show the research outcomes of what we've been doing so far. Uh, so that, that's one part, I would say on the research part. Um, then in terms of the technology development, so we're fully committed and we're working uh, with ClearSpace to develop some key technologies with some EPFL labs. And we're also trying to, um, to push also to develop some other key technologies, as I mentioned. So <clears throat> the idea is to continue this and also to, I would say, expand those type of initiatives uh, within Switzerland and also outside Switzerland, building other partnerships in order to continue and to push the developments uh, in the direction of sustainable space logistics. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, yeah. Um, I hope you can stay with us a bit for maybe also for the last discussion then. Um, but now we need to move on to the next talk by um, Oliver Ulrich. Um, Ulrich, yeah. <laughs> Pronounce it American already. <laughs> so I'm talking uh, English here. So um, Professor Dr. Dr. Oliver Ulrich will talk um, about biological, biological challenges in space. We have uh, robotic flight, uh, space flight, and uh, also, the, as we heard about the visions of human space flight, which has some challenges in itself. Um, Oliver is full professor of anatomy, gravitational biology, and cell biomechanics at the University of Zurich, and also one of the sponsors, like the FDFA and uh, Reformed, Reformed Churches Bern Eurozoloton and the International Space um, Science Institute, um, and director of the U Innovation Cluster Space and Aviation at the University of Zurich, Professor of Space Medicine at Jena and Professor of Space Biotechnology at Magdeburg and a Jack Professor at the Beijing Institute of Technology and many more honors he has, which I won't read out now because I want what's more important what he has to say and uh, maybe one more detail. He's also trained in theology as I am. <laughs> That's a very interesting uh, aspect of the um, conversation um, he will also bring into this. I, I thought of mentioning a bit about my training and when, why, why my motivation about the talk, um, in exploring this field in the be beginning when I was cut off. Uh, unfortunately, my techniques didn't work. Um, I was a bit delayed, but I think it's very, it's my pleasure to hear now what you have to say about this, Oliver. So I hand over and stop talking. <laughs> Me. <laughs> Thank you very much, Andrea, for the very kind introduction. Uh, I will now start my presentation. Okay, right. I hope I hope that you can all see it. Um, first of all, it's a great pleasure and honor for me to be here. And of course, we had many, many excellent talks before about uh, technology developments and innovation in space. And usually I'm also talking about innovation in space and uh, about all the benefits uh, space is offering for Earth. But now and today, I will talk about the most vulnerable part and most critical part of all these endeavors, the human. And of course, my very small presentation, I will be far from giving any elaborated answers and uh, not even a reasonable, well-funded overview as possible. Uh, therefore, please forgive me if I will be a little bit superficial, but I will try to give some inputs uh, about these uh, entire topics. First of all, the question of uh, biological challenges in space. What does this question mean? It implies three aspects. First aspect is the effect of space environment on humans. Second, humans' efforts to overcome these challenges. And third, to enable manned space exploration. Aspect number one, aspect number two, uh, or both have an empirical basis. First, human as an object, and second, human as an acting subject. But the third one is the most difficult one because it touches the aim and the reason and the huge question about the role of humankind in the universe. Therefore, biological challenge is not only a question of possibilities, topic one and two, it is also a question of purpose and of necessity. 
Therefore, you already mentioned many, many important and famous quotes regarding manned space exploration, and here are some of them. Because the uh, essence of human spirit, desire written in human heart, and of course, some people also are respecting the limits of the human frame. It means human spirit, human heart, and human limits. But what are, what is the human spirit? What is human heart? And where are the human frame or human limits? In our experimental empirical methods, we are not able to answer this question. We cannot provide answers about the prima causa of being because the experimental method excludes everything that cannot be verified by human made measurement methods. Therefore, it's not suitable for ontologies. This problem or challenge is also very well known in theology because humans' ability to generate knowledge is limited. I think it's very clear in theology because humans tend to overstate their own power. Humans usually think about themselves as sovereign and independent. But of course, it is required that humans are able to accept their limits and the limits of our existence. And therefore, there are, of course, limits for the human. The question is, where are the limits? Is the presence of humankind limited to Earth or not? Shall we leave Earth to take an active and creative role beyond our home planet? What is the universal meaning of humankind in a cosmic perspective? And these questions cannot be answered by natural science or theology separately. Because in natural science, we are asking, are humans and the material architecture able to live, to work, to exist? in an environment outside Earth, beyond Earth? What does our biological, vulnerable biological structure allow and what not? And in theology, shall humans and the architecture live, work and exist outside, beyond Earth? And if yes, how? This question can only be answered when natural science and theology refer to each other in an interdisciplinary approach. And this is often not very new because the basis of this interdisciplinary approach between science and the theology is provided by the relation between God as a causa prima and we as creation referring to God in form, matter and causality, but here accessible through our own scientific methods. Therefore space flight, you know, it's a dangerous and demanding endeavor with unique hazards and a lot of technological challenges. And of course, to ensure the overall safety of the crew, physical, mental health, and well-being are vital for mission success. And these challenges are, of course, further amplified as exploration will extend, extend to greater distances, and for longer durations, missions outside low Earth orbit, including cislunar space, lunar surface, lunar outposts, and of course, exploration of Mars. And there are a lot of hazards, major hazards of space flight. Hazards are the loss of atmosphere, exposure of toxins coming from a spacecraft itself, mechanical trauma, the acceleration, deceleration situation, extreme temperatures, high vacuum, space debris, of course, psycho psychological problems, disturbance of circadian rhythms and sleep, the radiation problem, and the adverse effects of microgravity, because low gravity is usually not present on Earth. In medicine, we have always to focus. We have to focus on the most um, difficult and the most demanding and uh, risky uh, challenges. And uh, therefore, rules of space medicine are common things occur commonly. Therefore, we have to focus on mission specific operational hazards, harmful environment, toxins, of course, also injuries, illnesses occurring in a body which is adapting to microgravity. Manpower is always on short supply. And of course, a space flight is taking longer than the crew is on its own with very, very limited support from Earth. In space medicine, 
In space medicine, we are working using proactive and reactive care, of course, to optimize the physical, physiological, and uh, medical requirements in a very, very unique environment of space. But space medicine is, doesn't see the weightlessness of space environment as peculiarity. Space medicine is seeing these special environment um, not as a pathological condition, but as a challenge to overcome. Therefore, we are working primarily in, a, in terms of selection, prevention, countermeasures, treatment, and rehabilitation. And it's very clear that the domain of space medicine is to prevent astronauts uh, from being ill and to prevent, of course, um, the negative effects of microgravity and other space environment uh, associated factors on human. In this context, our medical horizon is very, very limited. Limited because we know a lot of things during the first half a year in space because of the astronauts on board the International Space Station. But we know many, many few things after the our horizon of half a year. That means that a long duration exploration mission to Mars will be a mission into the unknown, a high risk mission into the unknown. And for that, we have to prepare. From the biological point of view, we already know some things about the effects of low order or idle gravity. Because Gravitational force has been constant for the 4 billion years of Earth evolution and probably played a crucial role in the evolution and development of all organisms. And of course, of our cellular architecture, molecular structure, including human, we know a few things about the effects of gravity on biological systems. As an example, we know that gravity is important for our musculoskeletal system, which is completely adapted to the gravitational force on Earth. We know it's important for circulation, circulation regulation, and approximately 50% of our sensible sensory information and inputs are coming directly or indirectly from the force of gravity. And gravity, as we know, during research in the last uh, 10 years is also important for our cellular homeostasis. Gravity is not only a challenge, gravity or the absence of gravity can also be used for the benefit of mankind on Earth. As an example, it's possible to differentiate and grow human tissue, organoids, form stem cells differentiated in microgravity into complex, small, tiny tissue organoids for transplantation, for regenerative medicine, precision medicine, testing, or as a substitute for animal experiments. Therefore, microgravity can be used also as a tool in medicine, as a, as a research tool, but also as a tool for production for the benefit of terrestrial medicine. And um, we know that uh, the NASA human research program aims to develop and to provide a knowledge-based technologies and countermeasures that will permit safe and successful human space flight. And here, NASA has defined high priority red risk for human spaceflight. Red risk means a very, very high likelihood of occurrence, and of course, a high risk and high impact uh, on the performance and success of a mission. And these high risks are space radiation, very clear. Space radiation with all its detrimental effects uh, regarding cancer development, cardiovascular deterioration, neuronal effects, then second, the uh, space fat associated neuroocular syndrome, that means um, the optic disc edema or faults in the chorea retina. Then psychological effects could be very, very severe, adverse cognition and uh, behavioral conditions, psychiatric disorders and problems of nutrition, in particular during long-term, long-duration space missions. Therefore, main hazards of space flight are space radiation, are the effects of microgravity. That means the effects um, regarding the uh, muscular system, the uh, musculoskeletal system, regarding the neurovestibular system, fluid shifts, the cardiovascular system, then the hostile and closed environment 
always a problem and uh, also associated with the hostile environment, problems of isolation, confinement, and uh, severe behavioral impacts, and of course, the distance from Earth. And distance from Earth means a lot of very, very difficult requirements for medical health care, autonomous technologies, um, and of course, communication delays. The coup is on its own. And I really like the concept of the so-called space exposome. Um, space exposome means that the crew do not experience these stress stressors independently, uh, but all stressors are acting together. Therefore, it's very important to consider the combined impact. Yeah? In order to have an integrated view on the effect and potential countermeasures against um, the uh, detrimental um, effects of space environment. Radiation is probably one of the most important showstopper of long-term space flights. We know, all of you know that uh, radiation is uh, coming from two major sources. First, sun, solar energy particles, uh, electromagnetic radiation, um, electrons and protons, and then of course from the galactic cosmic rays consisting of high energy protons, alpha particles, and heavy ions. And we all know that uh, our <laughs> uh, highly appreciated magnetic field and our atmosphere of Earth is protecting us constantly from the space radiation. Calculation about the radiation risk or radiation dose expected uh, for exploration mission to Mars are coming to the result that here we have to expect uh, 500 millisievert which is dimensions higher than the normal uh, exposure uh, to radiation on Earth, and which is also dimensions higher than the usual radiation on board of ISS. And one mission to Mars and back will sum up to one full sievert, which is absolutely high and uh, is also limiting the number of uh, missions possible for our astronauts, for sure. Detrimental effects of microgravity um, are mostly um, affecting our musculoskeletal system. Here, microgravity contributes to a bone demineralization. The released calcium ions were then secreted in the urine, leading, of course, to a higher probability of kidney stones. Also, collagen matrix proteins are being degraded, therefore making the bone much more vulnerable. And the loss of bone mass is approximately one up to 3% each month. And uh, additionally, and uh, in parallel, we are losing a lot of muscle masses with high inter-individual differences in microgravity. And the only countermeasure possible we have is exercise, exercise, exercise. Of course, there are many pharmacological interventions um, in test and development, uh, but not really established yet. Then, you were probably thinking about spacecrafts as a highly style environment. That's of course true, <laughs> as far as there's no human on board. But as far as the human on board, then we are bringing our own flora and fauna. And uh, as, an, as an example, here you can see a lot of mold. Yeah, here, a lot of mold. Um, and uh, in the places where astronauts dry their towels after exercise. And uh, you can see also more in the wiring and uh, in, at metallic surfaces. And there have been a lot of detection of uh, pathological bacteria and also fungi and all other rare things uh, on board of ISS in the air to surfaces and the condensate. Um, the problem is that the infection control on board of spacecraft is difficult um, because of the confinement situation, because of difficulties regarding personal hygiene. Um, Additionally, uh, droplets, yeah, maybe during sneezing, uh, do not settle. Yeah, they are floating around. And uh, additionally, there are biological effects of microgravity on bacteria because they are proliferating much more um, and they are more resistant uh, against antibiotics. Uh, nobody knows why. And, uh, and finally, last but not least, the immune function of astronauts is disturbed, also microgravity. Therefore, it's a complex problem. And during long-term space missions, um, the immune problem and infections could also um, bring a risk to human space flight. In low Earth orbit, uh, we know that uh, evacuation is possible. And uh, because of that, our current 
medical measures in low Earth orbit are representing more or less an extension of the already known flight medicine. That means um, the goal is to recognize, treat and stabilize problems to stabilize the patient and to prepare for transport and for evacuation. No extended treatment or treatment of difficult diseases is possible on board of ISS or is possible on board of any spacecraft. Therefore, we need a complete new medicine. We need a real, real um, leap in medicine in order to be able to provide the necessary medical care for long-term exploration missions. Because we have not only a problem regarding standard procedures, because uh, all standard procedures, in particular in surgery, are assigned to the gravitational force on Earth. Therefore, in space, abdomen, viscera, and blood are floating out, uh, in particular uh, from the abdomen or thorax. Um, problems of sterilization, we need new uh, surgical procedures and uh, a new pharmacology, and we have to develop all these medical procedures which are utilized on ground and on Earth completely new for utilization in space. Therefore, it's a huge, huge um, gap to fill. The good news is that uh, the human organism is able to adapt to microgravity. And you can see here a very, very basic um, um, uh, picture of the adaptation times in microgravity. And um, all systems are usually adapting within one and a half months of microgravity. First, the neurovestibular system. Second, the electrolyte system, then the cardiovascular system. And roughly after one and a half months, all major systems are adapted to microgravity, except, of course, bone metabolism, except, of course, the muscles and all the radiation effects are also cumulative and not adapting, probably. We also the good news, and this is a part of our own research at the cellular level, we also have a much, much faster adaptation time at the cellular level. And we investigated a huge variety of cell types in different conditions and, and regarding different aspects and detected always an absolute rapid response to microgravity and a very, very rapid adaptation response within minutes. Therefore, from our results, we have to say that our cells are capable to adapt very rapidly to an altered gravity environment. Our current research projects are addressing a question why and uh, how the non-specific force of gravity is transduced into a specific cellular response. And here we already found that the genomic response to altered gravity is encoded in our genomic and um, chromatin architecture. Therefore, it is written, our adaptive capability is written in our genome, which is uh, personally, I really think is very fascinating. Therefore, the question, are humans able to live, to work, and to exist in an environment um, outside Earth? I would say a conditional yes, because our biological architecture allows adaptation to altered gravity in principle. Therefore, adaptation could be as fast as days or weeks regarding the physiological conditions, or adaptation could be very, very rapid regarding the cellular aspects. Restriction and limits are, of course, the radiation, new ocular syndrome, cognition, behavior, food, and nutrition. And the next question is, of course, the aim and the reason. The question, why? Why we have to go to space? Of course, we are, yeah, of course, we are enabled because we are enabled as a human to acquire knowledge. And of course, we are also required to acquire this knowledge. Yeah? It's not only an ability, it's also a requirement for us as a human to acquire knowledge about the material world and using an empirical approach. And therefore, Regarding our biblical mandate to explore, this mandate is quite broad because we are named researchers. Uh, we have intellect, uh, can use our effort to explore. And uh, we are, or, or we have the mandate to gain comprehensive knowledge about the world, the universe, and life. And are also required to actively shape the world on this basis. Therefore, 
maybe the question could be here, yes. And the question about the how in terms of cooperation, and that is very important. We are not working as individuals, we are working as mankind. And therefore, this is really the mandate to work together. Cooperation is biblical. Cooperation and, of course, humility to accept our limits, which are absolutely present. And which is also important, not oriented towards human authorities, because human authorities, states, politics, opinion leaders are coming and going. But knowledge lasts much longer. And of course, humankind will also last much longer. Therefore, the process of knowledge and the process of space exploration can span many, many, many generations. And that's very important. Yeah, we have to be very demonstrate the humility to accept that we cannot reach these goals maybe in the next decades, maybe not in our generation, but maybe later. Therefore, regarding my hypothesis or my final, let's say, yeah, question or desire or maybe conclusion, I think that human exploration of space may generate interdisciplinary bridges between theology and the natural sciences to understand the role of humankind in the context of the universe. And although the very, very fact that we are doing exploration, it means we have to ask questions that go far beyond our technology and uh, the natural sciences, which can trigger a learning process to initiate this interdisciplinarity between natural sciences and theology, which is uh, necessary, I personally think, for sustainable development on Earth as well as beyond Earth. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Oliver, um, for reminding us, especially that there's not only a how we do things, but also why we do things. And I would maybe right. add, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think you would probably agree that the, the why can be very different, but maybe we also need a why dialogue and um, the, the, the diverse, diversity of the whys needs to be um, appreciated on the one hand, on the other hand, we need uh, to to get together on, to, on some purposes and aims yeah right um thank you and uh, also for illustrating the bi bi biological challenges and chances in space was very delighted to hear that we have some adaptation processes going on <laughs> yeah, we have. not only robots we need to send but maybe um they is there, are there any any like bio robots who have some tissue on board or something to test some effects of for after six months or something or is something like that like that planned already yes this would be of course the next step um because um they of course cell culture systems are always very very limited uh, in their scope and horizon and uh, what we really have is a lack of in vivo data and of course if we do not uh, able to uh, obtain in vivo data from astronauts uh, because of the limited number of astronauts of course and the limited flight duration um, so um, uh, one possibility could be animal experiments, but it's not human, or one possibility could be tiny organs, uh, tiny organs, uh, three-dimensional organoids, in order to simulate at least some in vivo or in vivo relevant functions and expose um, these tiny tissues for a very, very long time. But here we are running, of course, into other problems because we have to keep them alive and, and we have to keep them organ-like or in vivo-like for a very, very long time, which is also needs technological developments, uh, which are currently not present. Therefore, yes, I think um, we, we cannot expose astronauts for three years before we're going to Mars. The first flight to Mars, of course, um, will be a high risk mission because of all these unknown factors. Uh, we have to prepare, uh, we can uh, estimate the risk uh, and we can send animals and psychiatrists into space. But the at the final, final end, the first mission will be a high risk mission. This is very, very clear. Yeah, and before I hand over to Shan, there's one question from the other speakers from Christian Berg. Uh, he thank you for the interesting talk and uh, he asked, given the difficulties of long distance manned space flights and the enormous cost, what is the logic not to do these flights just with robots? Yes. Cost would be much lower, ten times. Yes. Or so. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I fully agree. Uh, I, I, I see not. Um, 
uh, that robots and humans are <laughs> anywhere in uh, in conflict. I see, of course, uh, um, there are missions that it can be done by robots, but there are also missions that can be only done by humans uh, because only humans have the full capacity of research and creativity. And if you have to solve any problem on site, it cannot be done probably via artificial intelligence currently. Um, therefore, I think that uh, I always believe <laughs> as a human is uh, perfectly suited to bring humankind forward also into space and that robots can do a part of the story, but not a full story. And therefore, I think robots will fly first, humans will follow. I think uh, this would be the, probably the natural order of uh, space exploration, which makes sense. Thank you. Sean, now for the audience. Yes, a, 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 <laughs> yes, Christian, <laughs> artificial intelligence will improve. I fully agree. But I think the most intelligent robot, robot will never, never substitute a human. That's my personal opinion. <laughs> Great. Um, we have a question from the floor um, from Christopher Brock um, asking for long term space missions, wouldn't one use centrifugal force to get one gram gravity in the living quarters? Yes, absolutely. Um, I can remember that the 1G human centrifuge has been planned uh, also for the ISS, uh, but then withdrawn because of um, technical and financial problems. Um, application of 1G, or maybe more than 1G, a little bit hyper G, could be really, really a countermeasure to prevent the musculoskeletal degradation and the adverse effects of microgravity. Um, but of course, uh, a centrifuge on board requires a lot of um, yeah, technological developments. Um, and I think for long-term space missions, this could be really, really um, a solution uh, for many problems we have regarding the effects of microgravity. Um, but uh, yeah, but it's, uh, it is possible uh, technically, and I really hope that we have enough power and space uh, on board of, of the spacecraft to install a human centrifuge as a space wellness center. Great, uh, thank you. Um, for the remaining two questions, I might try to combine them. I guess they are probably related. It, as, um, it as essentially asks um, with people from different theolog theolog um, theological backgrounds actually approach space exploration differently. So for instance, someone with um, a Buddhism background or um, with a, a different theolo theological belief such as um, transhumanism. So I'll leave it to you to <laughs> answer, thanks. Yeah, and the, the question is, uh, how, how do I think about that? Yeah, will uh, will will these people with different um, um, backgrounds like this actually approach space exploration very differently yeah. from your perspective? Uh, probably, I do not see so many differences. Maybe between uh, different theological approaches uh, regarding one common topic uh, regarding the limits of the human frame and uh, and regarding to accept that there is something higher and more important than we as, uh, as a human. I think uh, based on this common sense, I think there's a lot of dialogue possible. Okay, nicely put, Oliver. <laughs> 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 and um, Christian, okay, well, well, is this applause or is this a question? Just applause. Okay, Thanks, so, Christian. <laughs> <laughs> so we applaud you, Oliver, for having the, uh, giving the final uh, talk on this day. But it's not the end of the workshop yet. We have a short break now to get the last coffee cup for today. And then uh, we will have the final discussion panel on uh, planetary sustainability moving forward. What should be next, maybe? See you in 10 minutes. So it's uh, almost time to come back to your screen for the last half an hour of this stimulating day for me at least I was. <laughs> See some nodding. So I guess I was not alone here. <laughs> um, yeah, I want to start with um, a very short remark about the why why is it from a theological perspective interesting? And um, 
why is do we have a sponsor like one some churches are sponsoring here the churches of Bern and you are solo tour and this is because um, from a theological perspective we take, to take care of how we call it creation so that this is an integral integral integer system we need to respect somehow the planet earth and that that's a new thing i add to that maybe is it's the environment of this planet we need also to take care of when we develop into space and why we need to do this we need to dialogue on that as well but that would be maybe a big topic for another workshop <laughs> for now um, we want to start with a question to each and every one of you and Sean, you are the one um, taking over moderating the discussion until I will come up with a final question so floor is yours Sean. Thank you, Andreas. Um, and again, uh, we had such great presentations from um, all of you uh, today in the morning, in the afternoon. Uh, so we have prepared a general question to start with, which perhaps all of you could um, um, answer uh, around the table. So I guess um, the first question is that from the discussions today, um, moving forward, what will be the most um, pressing issues or the biggest challenges to be addressed? Or is there any um, actions um, that obvious actions that can be uh, uh, or should be taken um, immediately? Any obvious um, points? So um, anyone would like to um, take the lead on this uh, question or should we um, go around the table or Meaning, I think we need just to. It's a it's a mean question, but it's an important one. That <laughs> says I think we should just ask somebody. I I guess um everyone would have a different perspective here, and it would be really interesting to hear from all of you. So um perhaps I will start with um Christian Berg. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, actually, I would uh, answer in a similar way as Andreas and and as you've just uh, um assumed um, of course every one of us has his or her own uh, perspective on the things um, and I would also say I mean I'm of course um, dedicated to uh, sustainable development as manifested in this at the moment still 17 SDGs um, but in in that I think it is important that there is no one root cause for the problems and there is no one size fits all uh, answer to the to the issues. So we have a systemic a problem and we need to have a systemic solution. And in a complex systems, you can often not even say what is the cause and what is the effect because it's, because it is so interrelated. And uh, here, I think, as I said in the morning, uh, this morning when I talked about the phase transition, um, that we need to work towards a common understanding, a common goal, but from different angles. And I think we could learn today uh, um, how many things come together uh, in space science, um, many issues and how many um, sometimes trade-offs, but sometimes also synergies or benefits for our work, live, uh, for our life here on earth uh, can be can be fostered thank you i think that's very well explained um, Yes, um, I would like to move on to the next um, speaker appearing on my screen, also your screen. So Stefan has already unmuted. So please go ahead. Right. Uh, well, uh, I'm, I'm more approaching it from a practical perspective uh, as we're there to implement uh, the missions and we want to do the missions. Um, and, and dwelling further on this synergy between terrestrial uh, problems and, and the problems we face in space, the, the life support system and, and closed loop life support system is something which um, we eventually will need to have um, for long duration space flight. Um, it's also a long duration development cycle. So actually in, in, in ESA, we have already a program for a long time, MELISA, uh, which is looking into that. Um, and and um, that will need to be accelerated. And, and there's always a, a trade-off. Do we put more effort in that because we don't need it right away? 
so it's easily put aside. Um, but we eventually will need it, and if we don't um, do the right things now, will it will become on the critical path anyways. Um, and and then to come back to the terrestrial applications, um, all almost every aspect of this closed loop life system, be it uh, water recycling, CO two grabbing from the air. Um, food production um, has has its implications uh, on on Earth uh, or its relevance on Earth. So the circular economy, what Andreas was mentioning, this is uh, uh, exemplified in in this uh, technology. May I quickly add to that, uh, Stefan? I fully agree. And sometimes when I talk to my audience about circular economy, I, I ask them the question: Have you ever thought about the water supply in the ISS? And if you think about that for a minute, you know what circular economy means. And ultimately we have the same issue on the globe and that should be actually much easier to resolve than in the ISS. Mm -hmm. I, have to, I have to quickly add on to this one because I, I am actually based at Yavak in Switzerland um, and, and it is the Swiss Federal Institute of Water and Sanitation Aquatic Technology. So, uh, we have departments and we have scientists that are working very hard on um, improving uh, water recycling um, to provide very basic sanitation services to people in developing countries. But at the same time, we have scientists working on um, water solutions uh, for Mars mission through the ESA Melissa project. So, it is also a common discussion among us sometimes that what we learn through these Mars missions uh, in, in recycling water for, for the mission will bring many benefits to better understand how we can uh, 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 recycle water on Earth. So that's just to add on to that. <laughs> so um, let's move on to Dovile. You are muted. My apologies. Um, so I will look more from the international cooperation and international framework perspective with regard to the space resources activities. Um, so I think that the most pressing issue which we will have to address, it's probably uh, the international practices and rules applicable to those activities, because we somehow will have to agree on a minimum standard which will have or set of rules which will have to be respected by by all countries going to to, to on the moon mars or anywhere else thank you and uh, professor thomas thank you uh, i think we we have the issues we face right now, you know, with sustainability in the outer space are very similar to many of the issues we face in, in, in other areas of sustainability or protecting the environment or trying not to pollute or trying to clean up pollution uh, somewhere. So I, I think we need, I could say the most urgent issue from my perspective is of course the short term issue. The most urgent one is how do we deal with, you know, the upcoming uh, mega constellations and the upcoming market in, in nearer space. We are talking about a factor of 10 or 100 more satellites and as well operators in space than before. I think that's the short term thing we have to address now urgently. And I fully agree with Dovi, we need international um, agreements on that. And if I look back what happened in, in COPOS uh, over the past 10 years, I just have to say, we need to speed up that process by a factor of 10 as well. <laughs> so, but on the other hand, we should not forget the, the mid and long-term things, you know, the long-term sustainable use, this is like, you know, climate change. What can we do today? So we have, we face the troubles with landslides, whatever, uh, inundations, uh, bad weather conditions, and we have to do something against that. We have to prepare. But on the other side, we have to try to limit 
let's say the, the temperature rise to two, three, whatever degrees Celsius, we have to come up with, we have to agree on what we would like to limit it to. We don't know if that will be sufficient or not. And the same is with space. We have to come up with something we agree upon. We will take that risk. We will take that limit. We agree because we also benefit from what we're doing in space. And we are far from there. We are far from having the real discussion what is it worth, you know, for our societies? And what negative impacts do we agree to take for our societies? You know, even that we agree, yes, we'll not have that dark night sky anymore. We do a compromise. But this discussion has not even been started. Thank you very much. Um, Yes, uh, I think these are really pressing issues and it is a, a core part of my research as well. And um, recently I came across the Dark Skies Association, who is probably uh, more active in pushing for uh, preserving a night skies. But probably we will come back to this um, 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 challenges of mega constellations in a bit. So I would like now to move on to Nikolai. Please um, give your perspective. Yeah, thank you very much, everybody, and and, and um, a wonderful day, Andreas, and, and terrific comments from everybody so far. I mean, I think I would probably also comment it from the same perspective as uh, Dovile from from the national collaboration perspective. Um, I mean, for us, we sort of look at it from from all the different angles, perhaps less from operational, scientific, or, or technical angle. I would say, uh, but I think I would agree there with. Uh, with uh, Thomas about about uh, the, the urgency about debris and how do we actually uh, ensure safe traffic in in orbits, particularly in Leo lower Earth orbits. I mean that's absolutely critical. If if we don't get, if we don't straight this out, if we if we have a couple more accidents, um, you know the, everything else we just we just not be able to to be realized or at least be much more difficult. You know, so so the other missions uh, to go to beyond the orbits will be more complicated, will be more dangerous, et cetera, et cetera. Right, and then we we'll lose the tools that we have now for monitoring climate change um, and helping with connectivity. So I think that's that's critical. It's urgent uh, and it has so many repercussions. Um, um, on on our ability to 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 expand into space, but I think of course that doesn't prevent us from having experts that are focused on other elements, on resources, on exploration, on on scientific exploration, right? Um, uh, uh, to to continue their work. Um, are they as urgent? I I don't think so. I mean, are they important? Absolutely. Um, as, are they, are they, do they need long-term investment, uh, as, as Stefan is saying? Absolutely. So I think, yes, every, and of course, there we probably have different organizations putting different balance of resources um, into these projects. That's, a, that's obviously always, always difficult, um, uh, these kind of budget discussions, but I, we need to work on them now as well. Um, and from the policy perspective, you know, the, the, the questions that Dovili really talks about, you know, we need to start talking about it, international fora about you know, how do we approach the resources? How do we, that's going to be huge. I mean, that's, I think people underestimate the, the significance of this development for the next 100, 200 years for humanity. Um, absolutely enormous. I mean, it, it, it will dwarf, I think, what, what, what we've seen on earth in terms of resources, right? And the potential to transform human civilization um, in the coming uh, centuries, right? Um, perhaps not so much decades, but, but centuries certainly, but and how it will also transform life on earth, hopefully for the better. Uh, but I think we need to have those conversations about how do we share those benefits? Don't really mention that. Um, how do we make sure it's not just gonna be for the one or two corporations and several governments that sort of uh, behind them uh, to, to benefit, right? And how do we share those you know, capacity and, and, and learning abilities? Um, uh, financial benefits, right, but also scientific benefits and open up access to other nations. Um, I mean, you know, we're having trouble with inclusivity on, on Earth. Um, you know, if we don't get this right in space, this, <laughs> those, those conversations will be will be will be much more difficult even uh, beyond beyond our imagination, I think. So, uh, and of course, you know, we don't even talking about all the potential conflicts, you know, we, we see now multiple, at least two major collaborations, right, international collaborations for the moon. Um, you know, ideally we would have maybe one major sort of joint partnership, but that's probably a little bit 
uh, naive to expect certain things like that, but we need to certainly have collaborative conversations and exchange of information on technical issues and safety issues, even if you might have end up having two villages or two settlements on the moon, right, and beyond. So that international collaboration is absolutely critical, having that those those conversations, even if you don't agree on on all fully on all approaches. Some basic things need to be need to be uh, discussed. So that'd be maybe my um, my maybe uh, perspective. Thank you very much. Very good perspective. Um, I would like to pick up your point, uh, Nikolai, and pose this question to Christian. And uh, basically, uh, um, balancing the opportunities between the opportunities uh, from space-based infrastructures to actually um, promote sustainable development on Earth. So obviously, if we don't do it right, um, there could be many environmental challenges in the orbit. But at the same time, we, we have these great opportunities that transform environmental management that bring the that bridge the digital divide to developing countries, offering jobs, et cetera. So from your point of view, Christian, because you, you, you really analyze uh, or, or, or give deep thoughts in terms of um, 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 balancing growth and uh, uh, the consequences of that. So how, how do you see this? Yes, thank you. That's a pretty tricky question. Uh, we have only 15 minutes left. I'm not sure if I make it in that time. Um, I mean, we see this uh, even in the, uh, on, on Earth. I mean, we see this in the Arctic, for instance, that uh, now the nations uh, are competing uh, on the resources uh, in the Arctic region. Um, I'm also, I I'm, I'm need to admit, a bit skeptical about too much involvement of the private sector in space flights. So, I mean, I know it's a really delicate issue and I haven't really thought about this, but ultimately, of course, they want a return on invest for very understandable reasons. Uh, but there are many issues, as we learned today and discussed and touched on, legal issues which have to be sorted out, uh, common agreements, um, standards, and so on, which we do not have yet. And um, I'm a little afraid that we um, just continue with our growth paradigm um, and expand this to space, which will not work. Um, I mean, I mean we're, we're really in, in big trouble down on earth here and we need to think of more, yeah, more sustainable patterns and of living and um, doing business. And um, so the answer is, uh, um, of course, we need to proceed. We need to invest, of course, and explore the opportunities which are there. But I also see many legal issues and also some ethical issues um, and geopolitical issues, uh, which we definitely need to address before we uh, uh, before we really um, yeah, make uh, these current projects real. You know what I mean? Yes, thank you very much. And I, I, I think that's very well said. Uh, the, the constant geopolitical um, struggles have contributed a lot to um, the slow progress in formal space governance, in regulating all the space activities. And that is back to the topic of today, planetary sustainability. and and and. There are great initiatives from uh, uh, World Economic Forum on the space sustainability rating, etc. So, so moving forward, um, uh, a question to any one of you uh, is that what will be the kind of um, governance structures that could actually uh, be more promising? Would we increasingly um, be reliant on this sort of uh, uh, non- um, binding um, 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 structures, which can actually serve as social license for these commercial players to to operate. Yeah, the the the, the sustainability rating systems. So, how, what are your points of view on this? I can take it. Maybe just uh, no, expressing a few ideas on, on this. So, for the future governance structure. I agree with you that you know if we observe the trends at Young Couples International Forum, of course, since many years we work and we, we produce non-binding soft law instruments. Um, however, with the space debris issue with the STM, we see that there is a need of a, some kind of a basic set of rules which will be respected by everyone. 
like some kind of common ground. So we will have somehow to evolve from those soft law instruments uh, to a more binding instruments as well. Maybe it will be done on, you know, uh, at the national level, uh, like among like-minded countries. Maybe it will be done at the you know, corpus level. Maybe, you know, we don't know how it, it will evolve and what will be the real need. And at the same time, I think that the role of the governments is also very important, especially with regard to the private actors, because we are there also carrying certain international obligations on, uh, on our side. So we have to supervise those activities. We have to know what is happening in space with regard to the private industry uh, in order just to assure responsible and sustainable operations in space. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And perhaps um, a, a question um, to Stefan, um, since uh, you are representing ESA today. So uh, as we understand that um, some of the debates in the public media these days with regard to managing space debris or orbital sustainability and, and, and has been surrounding uh, the role of the US in, in taking a more proactive leadership um, in dealing with space debris, given that they are one of the major contributors um, um, to, to, to the challenges. But at the same time, ESA has also um, um, been very uh, uh, encouraging uh, spinning off uh, or, 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 or actually uh, assigning a cleaning debris cleaning missions to EPFL, et cetera. So what is your um, perspective on this and, 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 and the role of ESA in, in dealing with space sustainability? Thank you for the question. Um, well, first of all, I'm, I'm coming from the exploration directorate. So our impact on, on space debris uh, around uh, lower Earth orbits uh, is, is probably minimal, also in terms of number of launches. So I'm, I'm, I'm maybe not the best positioned person to answer this, uh, but in general um, at the ESA, uh, we always um, have tried to be responsible um, and, and try to do at most, um, not only for space debris, also what concerns nuclear power sources and things like that. Um, so I think the only thing we can do is to, to try to be a role model and, and, and an example um, for others, but including our member states um, uh, and, and try to, yeah, again, to be the role model. Yes, um, thank you. Thank you for uh, answering some of our questions. So um, Andreas, may I... Uh, pass the floor back to you. Do we have questions um, from the floor or um, should we continue? We do have uh, two questions from the floor, but I maybe um, summarize them a bit. Um, it's about uh, what can research, on the, on the one hand, what can research uh, on sustainability and planetary sustainability in particular help for the sustainability discussion? What is needed there from the political side maybe? Um, well, we don't have a politician here. Um, and um, then the other one is a very shorter one. What could faith leaders contribute or, um, well, uh, uh, argument uh, leaders, so you say, in, <laughs> um, uh, to, to enable the discussion on sustainability? I... The, I think it's a bit, it's a bit complex question. Um, and there's, a, yeah, Nikolai wants also to chime in with one, with one more remark, but maybe first um, the two questions I posed. So once again, what can research about planetary sustainability help political decisions? Um, maybe that's most, most of all question to Christian, you're more, maybe most close to the political discourse. I'm not sure if I understand the question fully. Um, what research on planetary sustainability can help to facilitate the political discussion? Yeah, maybe um, what comes to my mind is I'm not sure if any of us, uh, any of you knows the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Ellen MacArthur was the first female who uh, single-handed sailed around the world. And after that experience, she founded, a uh, established a foundation for circular economy. 
Uh, I don't know if this is um, if this is uh, the true story, but it is quite um, easy to assume that her experience of this very limited, confined environment made her think about the limitations of our confined environment as humans. And this goes back to my previous comment on the uh, circular economy. And I think um, so. Uh, I think it is really important that we as humanity understand, and, and I assume all of us here in this, in this workshop today do, but also people, the so-called men and women on the street understand that we live in a finite environment. And that, that is a message which planetary sustainability can help uh, transfer. And I have worked a, a lot with, or yeah, to some extent with political leaders and, um, my impression is uh, political leaders are not as stupid as many people think. They are very, very smart and they know pr pretty well what needs, what actually would need to be done, but they can hardly do so because they don't have uh, the majority behind them. And therefore it's important that science speaks up as Fridays for Future, Scientists for Future do. Um, and, and that science speaks up and says, uh, brings pressure on uh, or makes the point clear to the public that this will increase the pressure also on politicians to, uh, to get into the right direction. Okay, thank you. And uh, handing over to the scientists, Thomas, what would you need as a support from, let's say, faith leaders to um, push forward the planetary sustainability dimension we discussed during this workshop? Yeah, it, it's a difficult question, as Christian already mentioned. Uh, I, I think the I would like to take up the last point uh, and give you an example. Uh, you know, SpaceX and Starlink, um, I have shown the pictures of, of these string of pearls in the sky. And Elon Musk is the last one who is not just, you know, trying to make a business out of that. It's, it's a big business case, nothing else. Nevertheless, he did a lot and he, he was engaging with scientists and, uh, and um, space agencies, um, scientists uh, all over the place to address some of these problems. Why, why? Because there was the public pressure on, uh, on coming uh, from, from the larger public to be the nice guy. And finally, he didn't want to be the one who pollutes space, the one who, you know, makes uh, the public unhappy because uh, he's polluting the sky. And, and finally, I think the pressure comes from the stakeholders because they don't want to invest money in a company which has a bad image in the public, you know, which is a bad guy. So I think, you know, just that public pressure, and, and Christian mentioned that, you know, uh, we are having a, a vote uh, next month on uh, on using pesticides here in, 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 in Switzerland. Uh, this is a bottom-up initiative. Uh, it, it, it produces a lot of pressure and politicians are reacting on that and, and you know, they would never have come up with a few things which they did recently because they want to prevent uh, things uh, uh, happening or, or they want to prevent that this uh, uh, initiative is going to be accepted. Just as one point, and I think, uh, y you know, the combination of naming and shaming and incentives and perhaps penalties as well is probably needed. There's not one size fits all, you know. Uh, in this discussion, we need to try, we need to use all these instruments and the instru instruments are known, I'm sure, I'm not a specialist in these instruments, but they are known and they're used in, in other domains. So I think there's no simple question, simple answer to that, how we can convince politicians or uh, face makers uh, to, to, to help us. But uh, I think we need to use all these instruments which are available or known. Yeah, and that leads us to the very final question, um, which maybe Nicola, you can sneak your remark into the answer and you can start then. And then I would like to ask all, to answer all panelists, I'm not enough to each other the question, and maybe also those who are 
still in the talk, but not on the panel. Um, so the question is obviously, which needs to be asked, what do you think would uh, an SDG 18 could help uh, discussing the integrated dimension of sustainability we try to foster on this um, workshop? Do you think it could help or what do you think? Nikolai. Okay, thanks, Andreas. I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll maybe kick off. So, uh, and I'll leave that, that answer maybe to, 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 to the second part. Um, I think coming back to the earlier question on governance that uh, I think Christian and, and, and Dovili uh, and, um, re referenced, uh, I think there's, there's no really going back uh, to where it's only going to be governments in space, right? I think the reality is that to a lesser great extent, it's, it is a government and private um, sector uh, participation now. Um, and so we do need, in terms of future governance mechanisms, we do need um, sort of platforms that allow for those stakeholders to participate, uh, but also actually achieve some results, right? Um, so whether, you know, are they going to be sort of unilateral or, or unilateral or multilateral uh, platforms, or would they require consensus from everybody? Probably going to be difficult. To, to get consensus from all these stakeholders, which you need at least sort of main players to sort of come together and say, uh, whether it's come up with some best practices or basic notions of safety, um, otherwise it's just not gonna work. Um, uh, but I think whether, wh whatever you think about the, the, the sector, there's lots of benefits that, that uh, potential collaborations bring. You know, as we all know, business brings uh, sort of innovations at a faster pace. Um, and so, you know, I think there could be uh, it's, if it wasn't for sort of private investment and, and funding, it wouldn't be where we are today, right? Um, and so that timeline wouldn't be as accelerated. Um, so I think, you know, addressing the challenges would require also collaboration on both public and private sector, but also other uh, civil society leaders. And then I think, you know, very quickly on the SDG comment, um, I think that's a very interesting concept. And, and you know, um, to, to make it more publicly sort of known about, about the challenges of, that, that we're facing in the space sector. Why not? I think it should, should definitely be explored. Thank you. Um, Stefan, maybe you are to take on this, on the SCG 18? Right, I uh, was searching for the unmute. Um, it's, it's a, of course, an interesting approach. I, I've not um, studied that in, in very detail, but uh, I have the impression planetary sustainability as, as an 18 goal is more like an overarching integrating some of the sub, or not the sub, but the other um, sustainable development goals, I think. So that may be a bit um, confusing in, in, in the whole concept. Um, I also don't know if you've been working, for instance, on, on targets um, um, for this uh, 18th SDG, because that may clarify a bit better where you want to go with this 18th uh, SDG. Um, because that, that, that makes it really concrete and, and, and gives the, the real um, objectives. Thank you. That's very insightful. Um, Thomas, you want to chime in? Yeah, I mean, I, I was, you, you know, I was in favor of uh, such an 18th SDG since a long time. And I'm not absolutely sure uh, if the term is the correct one, nothing against the term, planetary sustainability, but I agree with Stefan, we, we need to shape that a bit more. But what is missing in the sustainability discussion and in many you know, even in my university, when I talk to people, they're simply not aware that there is something uh, which is closely connected to the sustainability discussion here on Earth, which is above the atmosphere. And I think this is missing in all the SDG goals in the UN SDGs. Uh, and I think that is, from my point of view, the most important thing that we include that part you know, of the environment where we have human activities, which are so important for the for all the other SDG goals, you know. I mean, we have mentioned a few of them today, uh, just to mention more than 50% of the data we use for the climate, you know, models, they come from space, uh, as simple as that. <laughs> it's not just in, in the developed countries that we are 
depending desperately on space services, but uh, nowadays this is so closely linked. I, I think this aspect is missing. If this is an 18th SDG, maybe, but uh, we have to make sure that this is not the overarching team, which is including everything, but it's really the team which expands, you know, the, the system to what's above 100 kilometers uh, altitude above the atmosphere. And because I think there's, there's very little um, awareness that this is there and it's happening and it's so important for our uh, societies and humanity. Thank you. Christian, do you want to? Give you a point yes, of view? I can pick up on that, uh, Thomas, because I think there is also very little awareness about the 17 SDGs already uh, in the general public. Um, and I must commit, confess that I also have some problems with the 17 SDGs, uh, not with sustainability at all, uh, in general, but with these 17 goals. I mean, who, who of us would ever um, consider 17 goals if you want to have something where you can unite humanity behind. I mean, we have in the Christian tradition, we have a Trinitarian God. We have five fingers on our hand. We have 10 commandments. We have 18 teams in the German soccer league, but 17 goals, I mean, that doesn't make sense, you know? And the only explanation is because this was a result of a lengthy and troublesome political process because everybody said, we also had a request and we want to add this and that. Um, but um, the, actually these 17 goals with 169 targets are great goals. Most of them are fully, I'm fully behind. Um, almost all of them, I would say, but it's pie in the sky, whether it's possible to achieve them at once. You know, it is uh, actually sustainability understood in this way is, an, uh, is a problem of optimization or maximization. You, you have 169 dimensional space and it is uh, even in maths, it's uh, hardly the case from uh, if you uh, neglect trivial solutions that there is one single optimum, you know, um, so it is not even, it's not even clear that we can actually in principle achieve all these uh, goals at once. So, um, but on the other hand, I fully uh, understand what Thomas just said and what also others said that we need more awareness about uh, the leverage, cap leveraging capacity and leveraging um, aspect of, uh, of space science uh, also to get us um, uh, more sustainable here on earth. And therefore I'm not in principle uh, against an, an 18th goal, but um, yeah, I have a general, uh, let's say, and I'm a bit, a bit hesitant. Thank you. Um, now we have three more in the talk and this is of course Dovile, but I'm not sure as your screen is Turn off if, she, if you're available. You are. <laughs> you're muted. I'm back. <laughs> Welcome back. So go ahead. What your what are your thoughts on an SCG 18 space environment? Uh, I cannot agree more with all these uh, very um, with all these interventions from knowledgeable speakers. So I actually don't have much to add even. I think that, you know, uh, as soon as we start talking about new SDG and so on, first of all, we have to think also about a certain knowledge and to, uh, building and also education effort. So this is probably will be also a very important aspect to advance for them. Yeah, thank so, we, okay, is it? Thank you. Um, Oliver, are you there? Uh, maybe he's busy. Okay. Oh, no, no, he can't. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, because I'm not a panelist. Um, yes, um, I think I fully agree. Um, but I, I think we should be careful to take into account not to separate Earth from space too much. And therefore, I would really be in favor of a SDG 18 solution, um, which in one way unites um, the uh, this development goals on Earth and beyond Earth. But, but I think it's a very difficult situation. I think the first goal should be to enhance the awareness of this. And uh, for that reason, I think uh, it would be a very good move to have a SDG 18 regarding space and space sustainability. 
Okay, so we need like a meta goal to make <laughs> meta the goal, SDGs yeah. <laughs> at, uh, present in the minds of the people. At first of all, yeah, you're, everyone good, underlines yeah. that. I think that's important. Yeah, so the, S, the G about the SDG. Um, okay, um, Gaetan, are you there? Yeah, sure. Still around uh, from the beginning. What, are you, the what is your thought on that? <laughs> well, I think I can only agree with what Oliver said. I mean, uh, we need to be clear on, the, uh, of course, having sustainability for space, space logistics, space debris, but also uh, for applications and the, and the use of space technologies down to earth. And uh, this, there is a lot to do still about raising awareness. But what type of data do we have already now, and how to use them? So. Uh, I would focus on the on the on the on the first uh, step, uh, which is uh, uh, raising awareness about this space data down to earth, so downstream applications, and uh, following up with uh, a more sustainable space uh, utilization. Okay, thank you. And Sean. <laughs> yes. Um, well, I I guess if we have this SDG eighteen, no doubt it is going to make people take the space sustainability problem more seriously and for political reasons or uh, whatever reasons it's, it really legitimizes that this is a real problem and people should take this seriously across the world but at the same time um, we have already learned from um, 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 experiences that this sort of uh, governance through SDG or governance through goals most of the time did not lead to concrete results. There are many challenges to actually um, realizing these goals. So then how, how efficient it is in the end is a different question. Um, there are already discussions that we probably have to move away from what we know uh, as SDGs, but there are definitely um, 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 benefits if, if uh, we could combine um, the space sustainability as part of the overall SDGs because in any ways, it, it makes people um, take, take this more seriously. Um, but I also agree with Oliver that uh, uh, um, space seems to be overly distant to many people and we need to uh, find a way to integrate that into the overall sustainability. I mean, the current SDGs and, and, and the indicators, half of them can only be measured from space-based technologies. So, so how can we actually combine this and, and derive a more integrative perspective? Yeah. Yeah, very good point. Um, what, what my drive motivation for this is, well, is now is like, that we have the planetary boundaries defined as a limit to what we we need to be care take care of uh, and to be cautious about on Earth, but that the space is not part of the boundary concept yet. So that's why I think uh, something like that needs to be integrated in the discussion. And there is already the research on how the planetary boundaries and the SDGs fit together or don't fit together actually. Because it's probably if we want, even if we would achieve all SDGs, we would have problems with planetary boundaries, maybe. So there's research on that. So we need to be cautious and uh, attentive to what we are doing. And um, <laughs> that's maybe something we need to address in the future. And that's maybe an SDG aging can can help with. But that's that's my, my motivation, so to say, why I brought this up. Well, anyways. I, I thank all of you, all the speakers and all the participants who endured with us until the end for this very um, stimulating and um, sometimes challenging, but I think in a good way, uh, day. And um, so uh, thank you all and um, for being with us. And um, there will be a workshop report, um, which will be, uh, there will be a follow-up May when this is done to the um, conference participants and speakers of course so you can then uh, enjoy <laughs> the fruits of this and um, with this i want to end this great day of discussions and my last work shall be again thank you so much thank you for